This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. everybody to Wrestling Omakase. It is episode number 197. Uh, this week, it's time for another Retro Roulette episode. Uh, this is our second one of these we've done. We did WCW Halloween Havoc back in October, and here it's February. We're going back to the world of old World Championship Wrestling shows again, this time, of course, for their February Spectacular Super Brawl. Uh, my guest this time, a first-time guest from the Voices of Wrestling, uh, Matt Francis. Hi, Matt. Hey, John, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me on. Uh, Matt, I, I usually like to start off, you know, with a new guest, I guess, introducing to the audience and talking a little bit about, um, you know, I guess what your background in wrestling is and, you know, how you got into this stuff. And you want to talk, even though we're not talking about Japanese wrestling today, you want to talk about your background in Japanese wrestling since that's what we normally talk about. Yeah, definitely. So, um like most people, I started watching wrestling as a kid. Um, for me, it was living in Europe in the late 80s. Uh, and so um, got to occasionally watch some WWF over there. Uh, I think I have eventually figured it out we were about six to 12 months behind what was being broadcast in America. Uh, but it was, you know, quite enjoyable. Immediately became a big fan of Ricky Steamboat and would try to catch it whenever I can. And then... Uh, when I was 12 years old, uh, we moved back to the States, moved to the middle of nowhere, Texas, and uh, watched Clash of the Champions 17, one of the first nights uh, that we were living back in America. And that was the day that uh, Ricky Steamboat made his surprise return to WCW as Dustin Rhodes' tag partner uh, to take on the enforcers, Arn Anderson, Larry Zbysko, and just loved that match and immediately fell in love with WCW and was a big WCW fan for a few years and then primarily a WCW fan uh, probably all the way up until college at which point started fading out from wrestling from a little bit uh, watched a little bit of WWF a little bit of ECW but mostly just stopped watching wrestling at that point and then uh, would maybe watch occasionally over the next few years and I don't I don't know why, and I was trying to think about this earlier, but late 2003 or early 2004, uh, I picked up a Ring of Honor DVD in a mall, and I was like, oh, I'll give this a try. And Ring of Honor actually rekindled uh, my enjoyment of wrestling, and so watched them for a few years, switched over to Chikar for a few years, and then started fading out again. And uh, But then one day, you know, New Japan World was introduced. Uh, thought I would try that out. I had, to a limited extent, back in the day, got a few New Japan tapes and watched stuff on YouTube, primarily because of uh, getting introduced to wrestlers like Jushin Thunder Liger and Great Muda in WCW, and just absolutely loved it. And so for the past five years, have been a big fan of New Japan Pro Wrestling, have dove through their back catalog as much as I can find time to, and um, over the past half year, I've actually started watching some stardom as well. So slightly expanding that portfolio. But you, yeah, you and I watched a lot of the same stuff in the 2000s, because that was pretty much my path too, was Ring of Honor and then Chikara. I don't know if we watched Chikara at the same time. Like for Chikara, for me, was like, um, 
you know, the the like BDK period was like when I was watching them. Yeah, so we would have overlapped a little bit. I started, um, I can't remember the exact year now, but it was when they were still doing the Tag World Grand Prix mm. uh, before they had advanced to King of Trios. I think it was the last year of, of it as the Tag World Grand Prix. I um, watched through the BDK angle stuff, which was just fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, s- slowly started fading away after that. And then by yeah. the time they got to their um, closing shop angle, I was pretty much done with them at that yeah, point. That's pre- I think that's pretty much where a lot of people gave <laughs> yeah, up on it. That, it that was it definitely makes when, sense. <laughs> that was definitely when I gave up on it. Uh, but yeah, so there you go. That's Matt's little back, Matt's background here in wrestling. I always like to hear from people because it's fun, the stuff you hear and the, fun stuff, the stuff that, uh, you know, differs from people. But finding a Ring of Honor DVD in a mall, that's interesting. I didn't even know they were sold in malls. Yeah, I guess they, I guess was, they were during that period. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. It was, I think... It was just the first few shows, and it wasn't the same as the DVDs you bought through the store. Right. I can't even remember how much it was different, but I was just like, I, if I remember right, like Loki was on the cover, and it was in, I think, probably a bargain bin, to be honest, for like <laughs> 2 dollars or whatever. I was like, yeah. hey, he looks pretty cool. I'll take a flyer on this. Yeah. And at least for me, <laughs> the marketing strategy worked. There you go. Um, but yeah, before we get into this week's topic, of course, I want to quickly plug the Wrestling Omakase Patreon. Uh, for people listening, you know, the month of February, we got lots of cool stuff going on right now. Uh, the big thing is we're doing patron submitted matches. So this is the second time we're doing this. Uh, patrons submitted all sorts of different matches for me to cover on the one match series. So it's, you know, one match per episode. They're very like bite sized little episodes for you to listen to. We're doing about two of them a week. Uh, our first week we've already done. Uh, we did two incredibly different matches, uh, a match from Battle Arts. Uh, you know, late battle in like two, in, I think November 2000 it was uh, that people raved about that match and people, you know, were going crazy about that match. And then a DDT cinematic match from <laughs> Peter Pan this past year uh, with uh, Takashita and uh, Yoshihiko, of course, the sex doll. So about two polar opposite matches you could get. And I did not do that on purpose. You know, I put uh, just like the randomizer today, you know, I got these picks from uh, patrons. I think it was like 13 picks total maybe it was definitely more than we got last time which is cool um and you know i put them through the randomizer and what came up was like you know uh kajinori murakami versus yuki shikawa and battle arts match one and uh yoshi uh, konosuke takashita versus yoshihiko uh, ddt match two so you know about as far apart as you can get there but yeah, the, both those reviews are a lot of fun to do. They're up on the Patreon now to listen to. Uh, the other big thing we got coming up, uh, of course, we do two full-length Omakase episodes uh, per month, exclusive to the Patreon. Uh, we'll be doing a match. I'll be recording it tomorrow on Sunday the 7th, and it should be going up Monday the 8th for patrons. Uh, it'll be a new five matches episode, you know, our retro format where we pick uh, me and a guest each pick matches. And it will be another first-time guest, uh, W.H. Park from the Post Wrestling Network. So I am definitely excited to have on uh, W.H. Park with me, you know, to talk all about the, you know, these these matches we picked. And we got some really cool stuff in there, man. I just watched the first one before coming on the air here, which was uh, the All Japan Tag League Final from 89 that W.H. picked, uh, which was uh, Genichiro Tenru and Stan Hansen against... Jumbo Shirada and Yoshiaki Yatsu. That was awesome. So I can't wait to talk about that. Uh, and again, that will be on the Patreon. Plus, there's there's other stuff too. We did a, I picked a Aja Khan versus Minami Toyota match from the Tokyo Dome. Uh, and a there's another All Japan tag from the 2000s. And you know he picked a match. Um, you know at the 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 God Tiger Emperor. Well, Kotaro Suzuki's mask gimmick. I think it was Tiger Emperor uh, against Ricky Marvin from Noah. So I'll be a lot of fun stuff to talk about, and that'll be exclusively on the Patreon. And then the other exclusive Patreon episode for February will be another retro roulette, but it will be our first ever New Japan retro roulette. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun to do. I'll more details about that later on. But again, that'll be exclusive to the Patreon as well. Uh, and of course, you can get in now, um, you know, get a full month. And then next month in March, we'll have our exclusive New Japan Cup daily coverage that will be exclusively on the Patreon. So, you know, we'll follow that tournament along every day. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work, but uh, it's a lot of fun, too. So, yeah, that's exclusively on the Patreon. You get all this stuff for only $5 a month, plus our entire archive, which goes all the way back to 
uh, I think last June now is when I started this. So, you know, all of our different past stuff on there, Tanahashi versus Okada, every single match they did together is covered. Naito versus Ishii, every match they did together is covered. Uh, we just did every Tokyo Dome main event from uh, 89 through 95, I want to say. I don't think we quite got through the end of 95. But yeah, I mean, that was a lot of fun to do too. So those are all up there for you right now. We're going to resume the Tokyo Dome one uh, toward the end of the year as we start getting close to Wrestle Kingdom again. Yeah, tons of stuff on there. Only $5 a month uh, at patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. Uh, again, patreon.com slash wrestling omakase. All right, so let's get into our topic here today, which is our retro roulette for WCW Super Brawl. Now, if you missed the previous retro roulette episode, it's a pretty simple concept. Uh, I put the six Super Brawls in a randomizer, or I'm, I'm sorry, I put all the Super Brawls in a randomizer and let it give me six at random. So the ones that it selected were Super Brawl 1 from 91, Super Brawl 2 from 92, uh, Super Brawl 6 from 96, Super Brawl 7, 97, Super Brawl 8 from 98, and the very last one, Super Brawl Revenge. Uh, I guess some kind of we're too cool for numbers now from 2001. And, you know, those are the six we got, which is very interesting. You know, like the, the beginning and the end, basically. Uh, and like some, it liked the mid 90s too. It didn't like, uh, you know, we, we skipped 93 through 95, and then we skipped 99, 2000, and those two probably were the best, honestly. <laughs> uh, but yes, that's what it gave us. And then obviously, from each card, we do the randomizer again to get a random match on each card. Now, I think that worked out better for Halloween Havoc than it did for this. And <laughs> you know, you may have seen the match list already, which is in the description. And it was like some of these cards, I'm like, all the stuff we could have gotten that would have been cool to talk about. Uh, you know, we'll go through some of the other big matches on each card as we go and like talk about some of the stuff we could have gotten. And it gave us some very interesting stuff, I will say. Like, not interesting in a good way all the time. But, you know, we'll make the most of it here. We did get like one, what I would call like major main event match, even though it wasn't quite the main event of the show. It was a world title match. But that was only after a redraw, which I can imagine that <laughs> we get to it too. But yeah, I mean, you know, what do you, I guess at a macro level, what do you think of this uh, slate of matches here, Matt? Yeah, so um, definitely was not what I expected going in, um, which to look at a silver lining, that could be a good thing as well. Um, I really did enjoy that we got to watch it from the beginning to the end, as you said. So it was, it did feel like, in some ways at least, a comprehensive look at WCW. And uh, I admit some of this could be very much shaded by nostalgia, but um, I managed to find something in pretty much all the matches, with one possible exception, something to enjoy at least. But yeah, definitely was not some of the more stellar matches I was hoping would come up in this, or um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's 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 not quite like you're seeing these start at WCW and all the way to the end because. You know, WCW, they Turner buys that NWA, uh, you know, not, I mean, not to get into the entire history of the NWA. He buys what was an <laughs> NWA promotion that ended up feeling like the entire NWA by the time, uh, you know, that at that point. But yeah, he buys the, the Crockett promotion, in other words, Jim Crockett promotions, in late 1988. And, you know, that's pretty much when he takes over. And, you know, but they, they still had the NWA name, you know, for like, a, I feel like 89 for sure. And then 1990s, when you start hearing, like, World Championship Wrestling more. So it's kind of close to the, the full history of the promotion. And, you know, Super Brawl Revenge, the one in 01, is their second to last pay-per-view ever. So it's very close to the very end of that of the promotion there. So, yeah, it's almost kind of like we saw WCW start to finish. Yeah, uh, when I looked at it, I think these Super Brawls covered about 80% of WCW's run. So, yeah, yeah like you said, not complete, but... yeah. A good run and definitely different. You get the feel of the different eras of WCW through them. Yeah. Um, you know, so the Super Brawl in general, it's always an interesting show to me because, like, obviously, you know, WCW slash going back to the NWA days, their big show was always Starcade. Um, and that was originally like a Thanksgiving show. They had to move it more to December after Vince McMahon fucked with them in the 80s with Survivor Series. Um, but, you know, Super Brawl, it always felt like that was trying to be, I don't know if it was WCW, like, being like, well, we're, Star K was the NWO holdover, so we're gonna make our own big show. 
Um, but it always felt really oddly timed for a show they clearly wanted to be a big deal, right? Because it's like, you know, they, they're numbering Super... I mean, Super Bowl is the only WWE pay-per-view that has the numbering system, uh, just like WrestleMania. And it did always feel like a pretty big show. But on the other hand, it's two months after Starcade. So, like, even as a kid, I remember thinking that's weird. Like, why is there doing another, like, big show? You know, there's clearly meant to be this big deal. You know, like, WWF did not do another big show two months after WrestleMania. I mean... Like, the next big show, really, is SummerSlam, which is, like, you know, what, like, five months later or something. So, I mean, at least four or five months, depending on what WrestleMania is. So, yeah, I mean, it just, it always felt weird to me, even as a kid, that Super Brawl was so close to Starcade. But, you know, they clearly always, did. they were all those years, too, where, like, Starcade got weird, too, with, like, the lethal lottery and stuff and didn't feel as big. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, or... Yeah, I was going to say, that's the example I really think of, of where they tried to make Super Brawl, so with Super Brawl 2, I should say. I think that's where they decided, all right, we want this to be our flagship show. And so that year, you know, they did the fully gimmick Starcade. They had the Lex Luger Sting feud building all the way up to Super Brawl that they had been building for most of the year. Um, that was their big main event. Um their advertisements from that year, I strangely enough still remembered, you know, they compared Super Brawl to the Super Bowl, so it wasn't yeah. just a clever name. Well, I didn't even uh, I didn't even get that that was what the name was referencing until you told me at a DM. <laughs> and I was like, oh, now I feel stupid. I never put two and two together. That's Super Brawl, Super Bowl. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, so I think that's the year where they really, you know, tried it that way. But then, like you said, just those two cards were too close to each other and, you know, depending i guess maybe who had control and what you know just each it almost feels like each year one they would manage to succeed making a bigger show but the other would suffer just because you can't have two big shows two months apart like that yeah like in the 90s it starts in the end of your era it starts to become like the return match show for starcade because obviously starcade 96 they do piper hogan they build it up and don't tell anybody it's a non-title match and piper wins and then two months later they finally do the title match and then, you know, Starcade 97, they do Sting and Hogan with the screwy fetish, uh, you know, with the famous non-fast fast count, and have Sting win, but then they hold up the title and do the rematch uh, for the title two months later in 98. Um, I guess 98 to 99 doesn't really have that. They just kind of do a Hogan Flair match when, you know, the 98 main event was Nash and Goldberg. But at that point, the, the company was such a mess anyway. And then, uh, you know... And then, you know, at that point forward, like, yeah, the company's just like, they're probably not even booking a week ahead, let alone two months ahead. So definitely. But, yeah. But yeah, it's just a very, a very weird show on their calendar, but a show that always did feel like kind of a big deal. So, you know, definitely wanted to do. I'm sure we'll do a Starcade one eventually. It's like <laughs> a Starcade retro would be a little harder to do because like, you know, there's not much going on in February. In December, it's like, okay, there's year in review and there's, uh, you know, tournaments and there's you know just a ton of stuff going on there's the build of wrestle kingdom maybe i should do the starcade one in november instead i was just thinking yeah. that and yeah. do november for starcade yeah i could do something like that but anyway so super brawl uh the first one we got here was super brawl 91 now the match we got was the second match on this card or the second not other than the dark match which was dan spivey beating ricky martin ricky morton in 311 so uh definitely a quick one here to start out with <laughs> Um, some other notable stuff on the card. Uh, it wasn't even the quickest match. This is a, a show with a lot of matches and a lot of very short matches. Uh, so you have the opener went 10 19. It was a U.S. tag title match. Uh, the fabulous Freebirds, Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes beating the Young Pistols, uh, Steve Armstrong and Tracy Smothers to win the titles. Then you have this match. Then Nikita Koloff beats Tommy Rich in 407. Dustin Rhodes beat, t- beats Terrence Taylor in 805. We're going to talk about Terrence Taylor in a second. Uh, Big Josh beats Black Bart in 346. Oz with the Wizard. Uh, of course, Oz is Kevin Nash. People don't know that. Uh, beat, beats Tim Parker in 40 seconds. So there's your quickest match on the show. Barry Windham beats Flying Brian Pillman in a taped fifth match in 608. Uh, El Gigante beats Sid Vicious in a stretcher match that goes two minutes. That was like Sid doing his last job before jumping to the WWF at the time. Uh, the Steel Cage match, Ron Simmons beats Butch Reed in 939. Uh, the Steiners beat Lex Luger and Sting in 1109. That's a really awesome and famous match that uh, we did cover that one on a five matches episode. I think it was me and Jojo Remy last year. So that one we had talked about. So 
Uh, but yeah, that match is incredible if people haven't seen it. Probably probably the best match of Lex Luger's career. I can't think of a better one. Uh, just really, really incredible match. And a World TV title match, Beautiful Bobby beating Arn Anderson in 1150. And then finally, your main event, Ric Flair beating Tatsumi Fujinami in 1808, which was uh, the fallout of a very convoluted uh, double title scenario that we I broke down in detail on a Patreon episode when we did the... Because we did the Tokyo Dome main event where... Fujinami beats Flair for one title and not the other, uh, and it really wasn't even clear to the people watching on pay-per-view that Fujinami was NWA champion but not WCW champion because uh, you know, at this point, the belts, they, they didn't mean anything. I mean, it was the same belt, basically. So, you know, very, if you want to hear a lot more about that, again, it's all on the Patreon on that episode. It's a very convoluted situation, and the Japanese press was not happy about being double-crossed, uh, you know, on this top, it was basically an over-the-top rope DQ, you know, where Flair tossed Anderson or uh, Fujinami tossed Flair over the top rope, which was a DQ in WCW, but not a DQ in New Japan. So, you know, they did the title change, but not the WCW title. And like, there's all these, uh, you know, like the Japanese papers wrote stuff like there's a line, I think, that was like, you know, they killed they killed their promotion with uh, these kind of finishes. And now they're trying to kill our wrestling. (laughs) And it was like, uh, tell us what you really think there, Japanese press. But yeah, they were not happy. Uh, but the match we got was Spivey and Morton. So I guess the first question, was there anything on this card uh, that you were hoping to get or hoping not to get, I guess? There's a lot of short matches here <laughs> that we could have gotten. So Yeah. Um, I won't say there was any match I was hoping not to get, but there was a lot that I gave zero thought to because, you know, they meant nothing to me <laughs> the, this much later. Um even though you had already covered it, uh, obviously the Steiner brothers versus Sting and Luger is just an absolute fantastic, like 10, 11 minute match. Um, Ric Flair, Fujinami would have been great um, just to continue on some of the new Japan discussions. Um, I would have actually um, enjoyed the El Gigante Sid Sid Vicious match. (laughs) Talk about how WCW was able to book a stretcher match where neither man touched a stretcher for the entirety (laughs) of the match. Um, Very WCW. Right. Um, (laughs) But yeah, so um, yeah, our match is what it was. It's honestly not the greatest Super Brawl ever. Yeah. Although it has a higher rating than some of these we're going to talk about later. This has a (laughs) 6.35, a 6.35 on cage match. So keep track of that. I believe it's the third highest. Yes, third highest. So we'll talk about the cage match inmates ratings as we go. Yeah, that actually surprised me. I didn't realize it was rated that high. It's probably stuff. it's a lot of it is that tag match, and then also, yeah, uh, you know, I think people do like that Flair Fujinami match. Uh, the so Spivey, let's talk about the two guys here. Dan Spivey was splitting his time between WCW and All Japan at this point. Uh, he worked more for All Japan than he did in WCW in '91. Uh, he did 110 matches in All Japan. Only 36 in WCW. A very busy year, at any rate, between the two companies. Uh, and he was actually one half of the reigning All Japan World Tag Team Champions at this point. Did not have the belts with him. But he just won the belts for the first and only time in his career. Uh, it was his only title his only title run in All Japan, period, uh, with Dan Hansen. They beat Williams and Gordy uh, on April 18th at the Nippon Budokan. They made successful defenses against uh, Jumbo Surata and Akira Tawe on June 1st. And Masawa and Kawada on June 7th, I guess right before they split up, uh, before dropping the belts back to William and Gordy, or Williams and Gordy, I should say, uh, on July 6th in Yokohama. So there's your uh, Piro tie in here for the match. But uh, yeah, Ricky Morton, on the other hand, he's here without his partner, Robert Gibson. Uh, Gibson's injured at this point. Uh, it, this is so we're, we're building up here to a big shocker where a couple months later, Gibson's going to come back and be like, hey, uh, I'm ready to reform the tag team, and Morton's going to turn on him and turn heel for the first time in his career. Now, do you remember, of course, uh, Matt, you probably do, I'm sure you do remember this, what he turned on his partner to, uh, he disbanded the Rock and Roll Express to join this epic stable. Do you, do you know what? this table? Of course, the York Foundation. <laughs> the York Foundation. <laughs> Fucking Terry Reynolds with her computer that supposedly could tell their wrestlers how to win, except they never won matches. So I guess this technology was not ready for prime time. Uh, yeah, it would not bring them much success. They have no. a they have a terrible match, uh, Morton and Gibson, on the infamously horrible Great American Bash '91 show, the uh, Ric Flair protest show, and yeah, like it just it's just weird. Like you know, you could tell the fans, I guess, 
I mean, I shouldn't call it a match. The match really isn't that bad, but it's more like just combined with the atmosphere of the show and like the fact that the fans, like when the fans pictured, you know, the Rock and Roll Express facing off, they did not picture the match that they had, which was Ricky Morton working on Gibson's knee for like 20 minutes. Even though it wasn't like they did it badly or anything, it's just like, I think they were expecting like this fast paced match with the two of them, you know, going back and forth because that's what they were famous for, of course, for these, you know, these fast paced matches. And or at least you know the 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 big comeback spot for Gibson and everything, and I thought they I think they thought they were gonna go uh you know much more like balls to the wall and instead it was like a a very slow legwork match so it was not yeah, all I mean, it, or I was just gonna say it was, it was a fine match psycho like psychologically yeah, yeah. Like, good storytelling but it was just completely the wrong match for that feud and that crowd at that moment yeah but there you go. Uh, but yeah, so the, the the York Foundation computer did not bring him much success. Uh, he would basically be out of WCW by early 92, and he would reform the Rock and Roll Express with uh, Gibson in Smoky Mountain uh, in August 8th, 92. So the breakup barely lasts a year, but there you go. That's what Ricky Morton's about to do. He's not, not there yet, though. Uh, if there's an issue in this match, I have no idea what it is. The announcers uh, sure don't clue us in anything either. They just mostly talk about how Spivey's big and Morton's small. That's pretty much all the all the announcers talk about here. Uh, Spivey, he jumps Morton basically from the opening bell, pounds him in the corner. Morton fires back with his own punches. Uh, Spivey eventually nails him with like a real nice DDT and a big clothesline uh, for a two count. And then gives him a crucifix bomb for good measure. Uh, and then just steps on his neck instead of covering for some reason, which was kind of an odd choice. But yeah, when he hit that crucifix bomb, I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? It's like basically hitting every goddamn move he can think of. It's like a, a an old school moves match here. Or like an indie moves match here on a WCW pay-per-view in a, in a squash in 91. It's very weird. But uh, Morton tries to throw some more punches and run around. Uh, it does make you wonder what the fuck the point of that crucifix bomb was since he basically immediately no-sold it. So, But then Spivey catches him in midair on a crossbody and slams him. Gives him a leg drop for a two count. Uh, and then Morton finally comes back with what JR called a Japanese arm drag. I guess that's what they were calling that arm drag at the time. Uh, and tries to schoolboy him for the pen, but uh, it does not work, obviously. And he basically dodges around. Maybe that is just called a Japanese arm drag, now I think about it. Maybe I'm being hard on JR for no reason. Anyway, uh, you know, it's not like kind of like that deep arm drag where they like flip, I guess, right? You know what I'm talking about, I assume. Yes, but, totally. Yeah. I've always heard that move referred to as a Japanese arm. Okay, so I think JR was actually correct in this case. All right, I apologize to the good old Jim Ross. <laughs> uh, Spivey then decides he's had enough with all this shit. Uh, oh, they, they have like a miscommunication moment where nothing really happens. It's a very weird moment. It's only like a moment total, so it's not really that long. But yeah, they, it is a very weird moment. And then Spivey decides he's had enough of this and hits a real nice kneeling power bomb. And a one foot cover for the very quick win. So basically a squash match. Uh, other than the, the one brief botch, it was a pretty fun little squash. Um, it also made no sense at times, but you know, I went two and a quarter. I don't know. It did make me want to watch Spivey in All Japan this time because it seems like it was pretty great, but there's not much to this otherwise. Yeah, no, as you said, not a lot to it. Um, just some other things. Um, I, you know, it's a Ricky Morton match, so his selling was really great, which helped Spivey's awesome moves look even more awesome. Um, on the other hand, I thought a lot of Morton's punches uh, looked kind of odd or weird, and I don't remember ever thinking that in a Ricky Morton match before. So I don't know what was going on this time, but his weird jumping punches to Spivey's forehead kind of just bothered me for some reason. Um, but yeah, I just love Spivey's power moves. He got some good crowd reactions. Um, other than the one botch, which unfortunately was like right at the finish, <laughs> yeah, um, I thought it was worked well enough. And even then, I mean, Spivey almost made it kind of work into the finish because he looked extra pissed off. I felt like when he delivered that kneeling power bomb for the win at the end. Um, so yeah, it was what it was. I gave it two stars. Um, we've probably gone slightly higher without the botch at the end, but um, I still really enjoyed it. It was a three minute squash match where a big guy got to do cool moves to someone who knows how to sell them it's hard to complain about that yeah i should mention too by the way uh this was this was the only super brawl held in may it was may 1991 uh from st petersburg florida so there you go it's a 
the other stats here they have is a claimed attendance of 6,000 and a pay-per-view buy rate of 1.04. Don't know how many buys that was in 91, but the next year uh, is Super Bowl 92, the second show that we got here on the Randomizer. Sub we have a subtitle, too. The Best Friends Now Bitter Rivals Brawl for It All. There you go. <laughs> very long and very awkward subtitle. Uh, this was February 29th, 92, which is where, you know, it settled into February, which will be for the rest of the run. Uh, it's from Milwaukee in the Mecca Arena, where I have a claimed crowd of 5,000, uh, with a 0.96 pay-per-view buy rate this time. Uh, this is the one where the randomizer really fucked with us. <laughs> so I'm going to read this card and think about these matches here. So we have a dark match. Obviously, we could watch that anyway. Big Josh beating DDP in 736. Then one of the most famous uh, pay-per-view openers of all time, Flying Brian Pillman beats Jushin Thunder Liger in 17 minutes. Uh, to win the WCW World Light Heavyweight title, the pre-cruiserweight title. So yes, we could have gotten a Juice and Liger match. Then Marcus Alexander Bagwell defeats the tailor-made man in 738. Ron Simmons beats Cactus Jack in 634. That's a short match, but it's like, wow. Ron Simmons and Cactus Jack, what the hell? Then the Z-Man and Van Hammer beat Richard Morton and Vinny Vegas. Uh, Morton's still using the heel name there, Richard. Uh, oh, wait, no, that's... That's, uh, yeah, that, I guess that's what he was using because the, the York Foundation's over by now. So, yeah. Yep, but still had to keep the Richard Morton moniker. Still kept the Richard Get Morton. over his heel mannerisms. Uh, and that's 1201. And then Barry Windham and Dustin Rhodes beat the Dangerous Alliance, Larry Zabisco and Steve Austin in 1823. A World Tag Team title match. The Dangerous Alliance again. Arn Anderson and Beautiful Bobby uh, beat the Steiner Brothers, Rick and Scott by DQ in 2006. Uh, U.S. Heavyweight title match, Rick Rude beats Ricky Steamboat in 2002. And the main event, Sting beats Lex Luger in 13.02 to win the World Heavyweight title. Uh, you know, that was Lex Luger's last match with the company. And really, he was already on, on his way out the door at this point. He went like, they, they talk about it on the show. He basically hit like his maximum number of dates on the contract and refused to work anymore. So he has not wrestled a match. Uh, you know, he did the Tokyo Dome on January 4th for New Japan, where he beat Masahiro Chono to retain the title. But that was his last match before this. So he basically just went home for almost two months before coming here to drop the title before he left. So just kind of a weird situation. And of course, he went to the World Bodybuilding Federation, that uh, genius idea by Vince McMahon. <laughs> but yeah, um, so all those matches I mentioned, so much cool and interesting stuff. We got Marcus Bagwell against the Taylor Made Man. Like when this one came up, I was like, are you fucking kidding me, Randomizer? Of all the matches you could give us, that's what you gave us. I would have taken the Z-Man tag over this. At least we could have talked about Kevin Nash in 92, which would have been interesting. But, yes, uh, we really got job by the randomizer on this one. Uh, pretty, yeah. like I said, the entire card would have been better. I was so disappointed by the randomizer on this one. So <laughs> this was the second pay-per-view ever that my parents were kind enough to purchase for me back in the day. I absolutely loved it then. Have such fond memories of it. Uh, it actually took place just a week after the very first um, house show or house show I was ever able to attend, which was a WCW house show. So I got to see, you know, some of the hype leading up to it. And, you know, I just loved this card so much as a kid. And then when you messaged, this was what we got for this one. <laughs> I really came close to asking, like, can we do a redraw on this one? <laughs> yeah, randomizer really fucking fucked with us here. Uh, so, you know, even though I, I actually, when I when I pulled up the show, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to watch Pillman Liger and Sting Luger just for fun, because I'm not going to let this randomizer roll my life. But uh, yeah, Pillman and, Pillman and Liger, I, did I say Pillman and Luger? Either way, Pillman and Liger was awesome. Uh, Sting and Luger was pretty terrible, but it was still an interesting match to see. Uh but yeah. Yeah, I watched a few matches from this one as well because damn it, I wanted to see them. <laughs> and yeah, Liger, Brian um, holds up great yeah. to this day, I think. Um, Sting and Luger definitely wasn't a great match, but I thought it was a good conclusion to their feud on Luger's way out the door. Uh, and Rude Steamboat was just another fantastic match as well. Yeah, that one, I should go back and watch that one. I didn't, I didn't watch that one. Uh, so the actual match we have to talk about here, <laughs> Bagwell and Taylor Made Man. We have to. We do, we do in fact, have to. Uh, so Bagwell is at the very start of his run here. Uh, he debuted back on November 1991 at Clash of the Champions 17. That's the show you mentioned that you watched, I think, right? Clash 17. Correct. Uh, so you saw ba Buff Bagwell's debut, buddy. What a big, what a big deal for you. 
I must have. I don't remember that sadly as a part of the show. But um, yeah, he went on to a long career afterwards. So good for good for him. Uh, so yeah, he's only 21 years old at this point. Incredibly young. Uh, he was. He does have a match on the class, by the way. So that's why I don't remember. I think they just bring him out to be like, "Hey, we got this guy, this kid. Here you go." That makes me feel better. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was basically considered like your prototypical blue chipper at this point. Meanwhile, the Taylor made man, of course, is Terry Taylor. One of the final roles of his career. Uh, so he had been in the York Foundation as Terrence Taylor, like we mentioned. Uh, but we also mentioned they broke up. So he just stayed heel, got this new gimmick, while also teaming with Greg Valentine. Now, I have to give you the... I don't know if you know the story or not. Do you know the story about their U.S. tight title change? I am slightly familiar with it, but I don't remember the details. So I'm looking forward to hearing it from you. So he and Valentine won the titles two weeks before this at a taping of WCW main event, okay? That show aired on Turner Broadcasting Systems on this very day, February 29th, 1992. Now, people, I, I don't know when TBS stopped this, but if you're a, uh, you know, if, you go, if you're old enough, I'm sure you remember that TBS was the wacky 05 channel. All the shows, you know, started and ended at 05. So, Instead of a show that would run 6 to 7, it would run 6.05 to 7.05. Hopefully that makes sense to people listening who are not old enough to remember this. I, I really have no idea when they stopped doing that. I wonder, I wonder when they did. But um, and Do you have any idea? Or do you, do you know? I'm guessing you I, don't because you didn't jump in. But. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it went through the late 90s um, before, I think when things switched over to more... Um, like when the TV guide scrolling channel became a thing oh, it was I see. to line everything up to on the hour. Yeah. Uh, I think that's when it shifted. If I remember right. Yeah. So, but yeah, so six Oh five and seven Oh five. So that happened to be when WCW main event ran six Oh five to seven Oh five on Sunday. Uh, this pay-per-view started at 7 PM. So if you were a fan of world championship wrestling in 1992, you had to choose between seeing a title change on TBS or watching the start of this pay-per-view. <laughs> Way to go, WCW. It's just really fucking funny. Like, why would you book a title? Of all the weeks to book a title change, why would it be the week where the five minutes runs against your own pay-per-view? Very, very, very funny. But, I mean, not the most prestigious title in the world anyway, but I'm sure no, there was... still very WCW, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure there was some fan back then who was like, what the fuck? Why is, why is it still going? <laughs> uh, but yeah, three months later, they'd lose them to the Freebirds, uh, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. So they were the third to last champions ever. They lost them to Freebirds. Freebirds lose them to Dick Slater and the Barbarian on June 25th. Then the belts are officially deactivated by Bill Watts at uh, the end of July in 92. Because Bill Watts basically takes over, I think, a few months after the show. This is the Kip Fry era. Of WCW and then Bill Watts, the next guy to take over a few months later. The the Kip that, that was the guy's name, right? Kip Fry, I think. Yes. And he he only lasted a few months. He was the one who was really famous for uh coming up with the idea to give a bonus for the best match, which did motivate people from every you know, from what I remember. I mean, you watch some of these shows and the matches are pretty good. But but yeah, it didn't last very long. And then um, you know, Bill Watts comes in. So at the end of July 92, you know, they had three sets of tag titles running around. They had the WCW tag titles, the NWA tag titles, and the US tag titles. And Bill Watts was finally like, let's just have one. Which, you know, you could argue with Bill Watts on a lot of stuff, especially his opinion on, uh, you know, where people should be, see if, who should be served at restaurants. But, like, you really can't argue with Bill Watts about, uh, you know, three tag titles being probably too, too many, so... Yeah, I don't think it's earth-shattering news to say Bill Watts, terrible person, but some good ideas about professional <laughs> wrestling. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so other the other big thing on this show, which this I did watch too, was the introduction of Jesse the Body Ventura uh, as the new color commentator after he left the WWF on very bad terms in 1990. Now, I don't know if you... Do you know the story behind the last straw for that? Which, this is what Wikipedia claims. I had never heard this before, but it was incredible to me when I heard it. It wasn't the video game, was it? It was the video game. Okay, yes. <laughs> he endorsed a Sega product when he had when the WWF had a deal with Nintendo, and that was it. And that was the last, like of all the things to lose Jesse Ventura over the fucking uh, Sega versus Nintendo console wars. It was very, right. it's very funny. Uh, but yes, he's back. He comes here two years later, as we said, two years off at this point, 
uh, and he would last two more years in WCW uh, before he got fired right around the time the Hulk Hogan came into WCW in July 94. Coincidentally they, enough. Yeah, they, yeah, Eric Bischoff was like, oh, I fired him for falling asleep and blah, blah, blah. And like, yeah, you fired him because Hulk Hogan hates him and Ventura hates him back because he, uh, you know, for people don't know the famous story, Ventura was trying to get the wrestlers to unionize in the early 80s and Hogan snitched on it. So not just a racist, also a terrible, terrible person <laughs> in many ways, Hulk Hogan. Uh, so a pre-match interview here sees... Mr. Taylor Bay man, he's he's very much leaning into like the Ted DiBiase cosplay, like the the suit jacket thing he's wearing looks exactly like DiBiase. Oh yeah, I mean it's cut exactly like his, the exact same colors, um, just a much worse fit on him. Looks like the Dollar General Store version of it. <laughs> uh, but he does spell out the storyline for us pretty easily here. He offered to take Bagwell under his ring, let him be his protege, but Bagwell refused. So as he says, I could have taught you how to be a winner. Now I'm going to teach you how to be a loser. That's a pretty good line, actually. So, yeah, no, it effectively think... sold the match. Uh, and before the match, we're introduced to some bespectacled kid named Barry Abram from Syracuse <laughs> University. He won some kind of contest to be a guest ring announcer for this match. This crowd boos him out of the goddamn building, of course. And the kid actually does an amazing job, like, keeping his composure... Uh, you know, despite the fact he's also out there in these fucking hideous blue and orange sh- shorts with a suit jacket, I guess because of Syracuse. Uh, but yeah, he's a perfectly competent ring announcer. So yeah, I thought it, he actually did good with it. He started off with like a thank you, and the crowd yeah. immediately booed, and he very professionally switched to doing the announcing of the match. And I thought he had a good voice for it. So yeah, good for so. Him. If you happen to be listening to this nearly twenty years later, good job, Mr. Barry Abrams. <laughs> I doubt you are, but you did a great job here. Uh, Bagwell gets booed coming out. I remember the, the hardcore WCW fans hated him for years when he was in this push, and I guess it started very early. Because he gets booed here, coming out. It's not even cheer with the Taylor made man, though. He gets booed, too. So, Roger doesn't like anybody. Not yeah. the ring announcer, and <laughs> neither of the competitors. Uh, we get a collar and elbow tie-up. Taylor backs him in the corner, gives him a very condescending clean break. And then Bagwell comes back with an arm drag that pisses Taylor off. Uh, so he gets up in his face like he's going to fight him, but nothing really comes of it. Uh, he does punch Bagwell in the face this time when he does back him in the corner. But Bagwell answers right back with his own punch. You know, it's very, I guess, old school Southern stuff here. And everyone's like playing to the upper decks, you know, with the, the way they sell every move. It's not really a bad thing, you know, just kind of an observation. I don't know what you th- what do you do you lo- like that style or do you just find it a little too hard? No, I, I actually enjoy that style. Um I mean I'm not saying like it's my favorite or anything, but yeah. I think because I because that's when I really enjoyed wrestling, grew up watching it, like I can just consume it and enjoy it like uh the same as the more toned down work we get these days, if you will, from the selling perspective. Yeah. And then Bagwell hits a nice crossbody for a two count back in the ring. He moves to a side headlock. Taylor elbows his way out of it as they stand up. Uh, tosses him out of the ring. Bagwell comes right back in and puts him in a headlock from behind. Not the most thrilling stuff, but, you know, fine. Uh, Taylor takes a powder. The crowd... I always forget, like, how fucking mad crowds used to get over stalling. Nowadays, like, like Kenta has to stall against Tetsuya Naito for, like, 15 minutes to get the crowd to, to like, care about it. But, you know, uh, even during the pre-COVID days, to get the crowd to react to it at all. Like, if you just walk outside the ring, nobody cares. I guess it's just, you know, been overdone over the years. But back then, you know, at this point, a guy leaves the ring and the crowd is like, right, like, you know, get back in there. What are you doing? Like, they're so angry. Yeah, that was great. (laughs) And I was like, you know, for all the criticisms of Taylor and Lord knows they're pretty much all deserved. You know, he was getting a good reaction from the crowd throughout the match. So I will give him credit for that, if nothing else. Uh, He hits a pretty weak knee after coming back in the ring, tries for a front suplex. Bagwell drops down the other side, almost falls on his ass in the process, but he does manage to save it. Uh, puts him in a headlock again. Not the most thrilling stuff here. Taylor comes back by tossing Bagwell to the floor again, and he punches him some more back in the ring, as it just feels like they're meandering at this point. Uh, but back in the ring, Taylor hits some like mocking slaps, rakes his eyes. Uh, just very, like I said, very lost and meandering around this time. Like, you know, it only goes, what did I say, seven and a half minutes, but like. Yeah it feels much longer because they just don't really have any yes. flow. doesn't have any, there's no flow to this match at all. Uh, Taylor then suddenly comes off the ropes and hits a gut wrench power bomb out of nowhere, which uh, when Bagwell tries to duck for a back body drop, 
That move was awesome. That was really stands out compared to the rest of this match. Because most of this match is not anything. And it's like, oh, that, that was a pretty cool powerbomb. Uh, Ventura, Jesse Ventura drops a line here. He says Bagwell's going to start asking for his mama pretty soon. And he yes. really stresses this home multiple times, which I imagine had to be a reference like him making an inside joke about Bagwell's famously overbearing and weirdly over-involved mother. Because, like, his mother was, like, really famous for getting involved in his business. Yeah, see, I just thought it was, like, the best slow-build wrestling storyline ever leading up to Judy Bagwell's eventual debut <laughs> almost a decade later. Yeah, I mean, it could have been a total coincidence, but, like, I don't know. The way... If he had said it once... I, I, know, I agree it, with you, to be clear. Yeah. I was just <laughs> Yeah, like, if he had said it once, I would have thought, yeah, I mean, it's just a coincidence. But he said it, like, three times. And I'm like, okay... He is sending this kid a message, which is stop bringing your mom to shows or something. Uh, the match just kind of meanders along some more. Taylor hits a suplex, goes up the top rope, and hits a so-so flying splash, but Bagwell kicks out too. Taylor goes for a pile driver. Bagwell backdrops his way out of it. Taylor comes right back with a neck slap for or a neck snap for a number two count. That's just so boring at this point. Uh they sort of mess up a little sequence that turns out to be like right before the finish. They kind of run right into each other accidentally, not in a wrestling worked way, in a we clearly lost track of what we were doing kind of way, uh, before Bagwell rolls him out of up out of nowhere for the pin. And they just keep going after that. Like Bagwell pushes him off and Taylor hits him with his devastating finisher, a forearm. Wow. Uh, and he keeps speeding him up afterwards. But he's so lost much the match. He goes Santana's forearm too. It does look, doesn't look good at all. Uh, gotta make sure nobody gets over it. WCW, as always. But yeah, Bagwell looks like an idiot laying there, but Taylor lost to an idiot, so good stuff, WCW. Uh, but yeah, this was quite poor. I didn't like it at all. Uh, like I said, there was some good little Southern-style selling, uh, especially early in the match, but it mostly was boring as hell, stupid as hell finish, botch at the finish, meanders along, one star. Not worth anyone's time. Well, I liked it a whole lot more than you, obviously, because yeah. I went a whole two stars on it. <laughs> um, did enjoy it less than our two star squash, though. Um, yeah, it was okay. It was fine. It wasn't offensive. Uh, I think those were kind of notes I kept writing to myself. Uh, I never got as down on it as you did, which I guess is reflected in the rating. Uh, but at no point other than a move here or there did I find it particularly engaging. Um, they did throughout the whole match, I think, you know, at least keep that narrative going of the young upstart against the veteran. So that was something JR got to talk about Bagwell's football background. So, you know, that's always great when JR has an opportunity to do that for a wrestler. Um, outside of that, maybe the most notable part of the match was Bagwell's hair and how well it stayed in place the entire time. So that was pretty impressive on his part. Um, the finish, I get what they were going for, um, you know, have, have it be that super quick uh, or super close fall where Bagwell just got it and neither wrestler was sure. So, you know, they both kept going, um, but it just didn't play out well. Um, although, you know, I thought Jesse earned some of his paycheck on this day for this match, at least, because afterwards, I agree. I thought both wrestlers looked like crap, but, you know, Jesse just subtly slid in the, you know, Bagwell might be laying there, but he's going to go um, get the winner's paycheck after the match. So, <laughs> you know, at least saying something to give him some credibility for the win. And, you know, little things like that, the um, kind of phased out from American wrestling announcers over the years. Yeah, I like what nobody ever talks about winning. Uh, maybe do they do talk about that on Dynamite? I don't watch it enough. Didn't know for sure. Yeah, I don't watch Dynamite either, which isn't an anti AEW <laughs> thing. I just don't have the time to watch Dynamite in addition to the other things I do. Yeah, I I, I watch it some weeks. I don't know if they talk about. They might have mentioned Winners Pay a few times. I'm trying yeah, to think saying, of it. I watched yeah. the first few shows, and I feel like maybe they were trying to, but yeah, that was a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, the Winners Pay is a big thing that they should mention because it's like you should mention. I mean, obviously it's not true in real life, but it's like. You know, in the the storyline world of wrestling, of course the winner should get more. Right. So. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, and again, this is what I was saying when I said those little touches that I found interesting in this compared to, you know, the rare times I see American wrestling today. Just the way they packaged everything, it just felt more organic. And, yeah. you know, getting the winner's paycheck is just one of those many little things that really add up, I think, to make a more enjoyable show. 
even when the wrestling's not the best, as was the case in this match. Yeah. So here you go. This show had a 7.12 on cage match, the highest by far, and we got probably the worst match of the show. Yeah. Go, go, well deserved the overall rating. Fantastic <laughs> show. Good job, us. Uh, we skip ahead now to Super Brawl 6, uh, which was February 11th, 96. Uh, so we go, basically, we jump all the way to the Hogan era. This is like the end of the pre-NWO Hogan era, which was not a good run for the company, I will say. I mean, obviously, they did some of their best business ever, but I mean, the pay-per-view buy rate here really isn't that great. It's 0. 0.6, where they claimed 7,200. Uh, you know, this is the Bayfront Center in St. Petersburg. I think that's the same place 91 was. Um, but yeah, this show has a 4.6 rating on Cage Match. Not a good show, I guess. I guess it doesn't, it's not really a big deal what we got here. So originally what we got was uh, Kevin Sullivan beating Brian Pillman in the I Respect You Strap match in 59 seconds. And I remembered after the, the randomizer brought that up, I'm like, you know what? That really shouldn't be, even be in here because it's really more of an angle than a match. I mean, even besides the fact that it's under a minute, the whole thing is it's, it's the start of the loose cannon Brian Pillman thing where he's like, you know, I respect you, Booker man. And then, like, you know, works there. You into giving him a, a shoot release for the company and then goes inside to WWE for more money, which was like one of the all time great, uh, you know, great moves on his part. But yeah, I mean, it just didn't feel like something worth, you know, I mean, I basically just recapped it for you right there. I mean, yeah. it wouldn't have been that interesting to talk about. Uh, extremely memorable moment in WCW history. I think everyone yeah. who was watching at the time remembers it, but for our purposes, just not a match that you can <laughs> discuss and analyze. Yeah. So the card here, Fault Count Anywhere tag team match, the Nasty Boys, uh, Knobs and Sags, beating the public enemy, Grunge and Rock or Rock in 749. Uh, Johnny B. Bad beats Diamond Dallas Page in 1459 to retain, to retain the World TV title. I think that would have been, that had to be one of his last matches in WCW. As he jumps to WWF to be Mark Merrill. He's at that WrestleMania. Uh, Lex Luger and Sting beat Harlem Heat, Booker T, and Stevie Ray in 11:49 to retain the World Tag Team Titles. Uh, Conan beats the One Man Gang to retain the U.S. Heavyweight Title. Uh, the Irish Factory Strap Match we just talked about, and then they they do another l- little match here with Arn Anderson, and Kevin Sullivan that goes 3:45. Then another World Tag Team Title match: Lex Luger and Sting beating the Road Warrior, or uh, actually. A go through double DQ with the Road Warriors, uh, Road Warrior Animal and Road Warrior Hawk. One of their first matches, I believe, back as a team after uh, Animal's back injury and Hawk was all over in, in New Japan doing the Hellraisers uh, with Kensuke Sasaki. But yeah, that went 1355. Then the match we're going to talk about here, the match we got in the redraw, Ric Flair beating Randy Savage to, uh, to win the WWE Heavyweight title in a steel cage match in 19 minutes. The main event was a steel cage match with Hulk Hogan and the Giant. Uh, Hulk Hogan being the Giant in 1504. And this was like going to lead up to the uh, infamous uncensored uh, eight on two or whatever the fuck it was cage match at a uh, yeah at, at uncensored the next month. But yeah, this is a cage match for the for the WWE World Title. Now this belt it really bounced around a lot between Hogan's big reigns during this period. Uh, thought it might be fun to go over the title history here briefly. So Hogan of course wins it. In his very first WCW match against Ric Flair on July 17th, 94. Way to build to the big moment, WCW. <laughs> I mean, that did a really good buy rate for them. Like, that, that buy rate, I guess, was so big that it paid off Hogan's contract, basically. Right. But, like, it still, it probably, if anything, that means it could have done even bigger if you would actually exactly. build to it. Uh, so Hogan holds it for well over a year. He loses it to the Giant via disqualification at Halloween Havoc 95. So he couldn't even do a real job to the guy they were promoting as Andre the Giant's son. Uh, th- th- this, do you remember the finish for that? How crazy it was? How stupid? Yeah, it was just awful and unfortunately <laughs> very typical of Hogan's booking in WCW at the time. So to people who don't know this story, Jimmy Hart was Hogan's manager since he came into WCW. Actually, even before that, he started managing him at the very end of his WWF run. Uh, and he put a clause in Hogan's contract as a double cross, that the belt could change on hands on DQ because you know the manager signs the match contract. We put that clause in there as a double cross. The belt could change hands on DQ. Then somehow, so he attacks Hogan during the match, which should be a DQ win for the Giant because uh-huh. he because Hogan was the one who got attacked. But because Hart is Hogan's manager and Hart got involved, it's a DQ for Hogan. 
or the DQ lost for Hogan and the Giant wins. What the fuck? I don't think they. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard of that rule in pro wrestling before or since. No, I mean, no matter <laughs> what they were going for with that finish, the Giant was going to look weak. But then they couldn't even execute the finish in a logical fashion. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, the brain genius is in charge of WCW in, in storyline. I never understood why they always portrayed their own upper management storyline as completely incompetent. I guess it was realistic, but it was <laughs> like, like no matter what period you're talking about, the, like JJ Dillon during the NWO period was always portrayed as a fucking idiot. So here, uh, this the, the brain genius is whoever was in charge of WCW in, in Cannes at the time. I don't. It was probably like just the board of governors or whatever the fuck they used to say. They decided to vacate the title. Instead of just doing what they should have done, which is, well, that's obviously bullshit. Here's your belt back, Hogan. You weren't pinned or submitted. Uh, your, your manager put this stupid clause in and then attacked you. And for some reason, the referee awarded the match to the Giant. And he also got the title because of his clause. So, yeah. Good so instead, on. Of... Referee decisions are final. Except <laughs> so when they're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, still, then, I guess the Giant should have been champion. <laughs> right, but, that's true. Like, the, like, the reputation isn't final enough to make Giant champion, but we're not going <laughs> to give Hogan the belt back. So they vacate the title and they put it up in the first ever 60 man three ring battle royal at World War III. What If you've never seen one of those in WWE Network, you have to go do it. Because, like, okay, maybe in, in the HD era, having three simultaneous little screens. Uh, with three rings actually could work. Like people have pretty big TVs there, right? I mean, I have a I have a pretty nice TV. I could definitely see three screens. Uh, you know, with three rings or you know different three different rings looking pretty good on my TV. Try watching that with 1996 or 1995 technology. Uh, like go on the network and watch it on your squish screen. You know, with the black bars on each side, and then your three split screens. It looks horrible. You can't see a single fucking thing that is going on during the the split screen portion. I mean, it's like trying to watch, uh, I don't know, like trying to fucking do Where's Waldo or something just to figure following the action. It's fucking horrible. I don't know. Am I exaggerating? Am I? I don't think I'm exaggerating. Well, let me leave by saying when I was a young teenager, uh, maybe not as wise or intelligent as I am today. I was really excited when they announced this concept. <laughs> and I was like, this is unbelievable. This will be great. And I watched World, the first World War Three, and it was exactly as you described. <laughs> Even without the benefit of hindsight of like, oh, well, it could have worked today. Like just of the era. It was just awful to watch. Um, couldn't follow like your favorite stars at all because they might be on screen for <laughs> half a second the entire match. Uh, countless eliminations missed by the cameras and you know so the announcers occasionally be like oh and you know sergeant craig Pittman and firebreaker chip and whoever else has all been eliminated and it's like oh okay <laughs> um, and just absolutely awful concept and then they ran it what like three more times or yeah something? they went they, no, no, yeah oh. three more times in 95 96 97 98 because then they replaced yeah. it they replaced it with mayhem in 99 but yeah, yeah. Three, they ran the same four times. The same was horrible. And you're like, you know what? Let's do it three more times. <laughs> I, like, okay. I get trying it once to do something different. <laughs> Even if you know it's going to suck, you, you know, maybe you can get suckers like me to pay money who are like, oh, this sounds like it will be cool. Yeah. I just don't know how they kept going back to that well. Um, but yeah, so the <laughs> World War III. Uh, I mean, they did eventually, I think once it got down to 20 people, they would combine it into one ring, yes. which at, at that point it's a regular battle royal, which is fine, I guess. But like up to that point, it's unwatchable. Uh, so Savage wins that. I think that's like Savage wins it after Hogan kind of gets like cheated out of the match. And Hogan. If I remember. Right, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I, I don't remember how he gets cheated. So if you remember, tell me. I was like, if I remember, Savage is just essentially laying unconscious in the middle of the ring for the last little bit of the match. And then. Um, yeah, I think Hogan gets cheated out by, um, oh, crap. I would say maybe remnants of the Dungeon of Doom still at that point. Like, yeah. Like, you were still keeping that storyline going, even though it had been blown off. And I so, think I think what happens is he throws somebody out who the refs don't see, even though there's six refs out there, so they, right. they all miss it. And then whoever that was throws Hogan out. I don't remember who it was. but yeah. And then uh, he announced 
Savage is the winner while again look laying on his back completely out of it. And, and again, so a new champ looking so strong compared to Hogan. <laughs> and then Hogan refuses to endorse him and the crowd gets so mad at him. If I remember correctly. Yes. The crowd's like fucking starts booing him. Uh but yeah, so Savage holds it for a month. He loses it to Ric Flair at Starcade after Flair wins that kind of famous triangle match against Sting and Luger for the median shot. So again, way to make Savage look like, an, look like an idiot. He couldn't beat a guy who just had to go through a whole other match. Uh Flair holds it for all for like uh less than a month. He loses it back to Savage on January twenty second on Nitro. Uh but then he loses it back to Flair here on February eleventh. Uh, really rapid firing the changes here. And then Flair holds it for all three months before losing it to the Giant on episode of Nitro on April twenty second. Giant holds it four months before losing it to Hogan at Hogwild, uh, just after the NWO formation in August. And Hogan, again, he's the only guy who gets to have a real title reign. He holds it for almost exactly a year. He loses it to Lex Luger, who holds it for five days, before losing it back to Hogan. So there you go. No one but no one but the Hulk, no one but the Hulkster gets a real reign during this period. Uh, but uh, this feud, though, it stretches. It really started back in '95. Featured a pretty memorable angle where Flair attacks Savage's dad, Angelo Papo, at Slamboree. When they're like, they they brought Papo there to be inducted in WWE's version of the Hall of Fame, uh, which is actually the same. Oh, they mentioned this. It's the same building as this show, actually. Um, and yeah, like, you know, the the, the Hall of, like, I, basically what I remember is like, there's no justification, I guess, for putting Papo in their Hall of Fame, except we want to have <laughs> Ric Flair attack him for an angle, I guess. Which is kind of funny. But I've read, uh, you know, I think in books and like online before, the the Savage Flair feud in '95 was actually like a huge hit at the time, especially on the house show circuit, where you know Hogan obviously did not work many house shows at all. But like the Savage Flair guy, Savage Flair feud, I guess, did do a bunch of house show main events, and they supposedly did like the the biggest business for the house show business really since the company was bought by Ted Turner at that point. So yeah, I remember hearing that as well, and you know, I have no evidence or records pointing to that but if you just look at how much the two were programmed with each other around this time to keep that feud going and the different um twists and turns they had in it i think that gives credence to yeah. like, success yeah I mean, it was clearly like just drawing them it, it, they definitely acted like it was drawing them big houses i will say that uh, at this point it's definitely a, a little bit long in the tooth but there will be a turn here at the end to try to give it a bit more life uh we start with a great flare promo that starts with a woman hitting on gene now, it has to be said that Flair flat out says at the end of the match will walk out with Miss Elizabeth. It tried to be a spoiler as it would turn out, but uh, you probably just thought when you're watching it live that it was just more Flair being Flair, you know? Because that was what their whole WWF view was built around, too. Flair saying, uh, you know, she was with me before she was with you and all that stuff. But this yeah. time he, he really does get her. Right. I remember, you know, this is a match that actually has stuck with me over the years. And I remember at the time, being like, oh, this is just Flair being Flair. But then I will say, and to give Elizabeth some credit, because I think a lot of times people don't give her much credit for her um, acting chops, if you will, in a wrestling role. Uh, when Savage has his interview next, Elizabeth seemed a lot more, or broadcasting a lot more nervous energy than what she usually mm -hmm. does. And then like just the way she responded to Savage when she asked him a question at the end of the interview, I remember as a teenager even being like, like, wait a second, like, is something going to happen here? <laughs> and I still didn't think it would, but they had created just that seed of doubt in my mind. So good for them. Uh, Savage, like you just said, cuts a completely incomprehensible promo. I mean, the promo has really nothing to do with the player match. It's all about how he and Hogan have, I guess, quote, rebonded thanks to Elizabeth's help. I didn't realize they had a split at all. I guess maybe they from the World War Three thing. Uh, I didn't remember that much either. And yeah. then I was surprised how much to use the term mega powers as well, I will say. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they didn't have that one trademarked. Uh, and he also says they're going to divide and reconquer. Because Mean Gene's, but mean Gene's basically like, you know you guys are in separate matches tonight, right? <laughs> and Savage's like, we're going to divide and reconquer. And then leaves. And he barely even mentions Flair until the very end. But I guess this was all the setup for their fucking crazy team match at uh, Uncensored. Michael Buffer, of course, here to the introduction. The... I remember as a kid being like the first time I saw Michael Buffer on Nitro being like, they got the boxing guy. What the hell? Like it, just, it did make it feel like a really big deal when he would do these announcements, but yeah, so in high thing, first, he was terrible at them. <laughs> I mean, exactly. The first couple times I remember thinking it was really cool. 
And then it seemed odd because it lost its specialness. Yeah. And then, yeah, the few times I've seen them in hindsight, it's just, I mean, could not be more clear. This is a guy just cashing in a check. Yeah. Uh, I forgot that Randy Savage had a fucking electric guitar remix of his normal graduation song theme at this point, which is pretty hilarious. Like, they're trying to make this song sound cool, I guess, but this song is not cool. So, uh... Well, speaking of not cool and buffer, I also appreciate that during his, you know, stylized long introductions, he makes sure to cram in there, you know, and the international spokesperson for Slim Jim, <laughs> Randy Savage. I like, really got to put the corporate sponsorship <laughs> line in there. I made a note of that too because it was so fucking funny. <laughs> He's like, oh, Slim Jim. I'm like, why are we plugging Slim Jim? And then just in case you missed that one, Savage grabbed one from a fan in the crowd for good measure. Like, we yes. get it, Randy. Slim Jim. All right. <laughs> Uh, he gets a lot of pyro, by the way, like a lot of pyro. Flair got none, so Flair should sue them. But I will say, like, again, for the whole presentation, uh, not to keep beating this horse, but I thought the presentation for this match was so cool. All four people had, you know, their outfits were spot on, just how they looked. The pyro for Savage, both of them just know how to control a crowd with their entrances. Uh, I, I was hyped by the time it got to the opening bell. Uh, so Tony lets us know here the last time Woman and Elizabeth were both, at, you know, here, Woman was also with Savage. I totally forgot about that. But turned on him to side with Flair. I, like, Woman is, you know, not, I mean, obviously that's Nancy Benoit who rest her soul. Mm -hmm. But she was a, such a natural heel to me that it's, like, very weird to think of her as, like, a baby face with Savage. So, uh, but yes, poor Savage got turned on by his girls twice in a row against Flair. <laughs> that that sort of thing just always seemed to happen a lot to the babyfaces in WCW. Just, oh, especially Savage of this era. It yeah. seemed like he was just well, completely out of his luck, if you will. Well, every and, and like Sting would get turned on constantly by everybody. DD, DDP for a while would get turned on constantly by everybody. Just felt like they babyfaces get turned on a lot in this company. <laughs> Uh, Bobby Heaton, I gotta give this just, just exact quote here from Bobby Heaton about woman. Quote, she's a beautiful woman and a treacherous woman, but then again, <laughs> she is a woman. So Bobby Heaton, feminist, feminist uh, icon here. Yeah, no, fantastic quote from Bobby. Um, speaking <laughs> of him, though, I'd also like to point out that at the beginning of the, the match, uh, when the rest of the announced crew is on camera, including him, um, he has his back turned to the camera. Tony is trying desperately to get Bobby to turn around and look at the camera with the rest of them for talking about the match. And then finally, Bobby starts very slowly spinning in his chair and Tony pretty much just grabs his chair and <laughs> more rapidly spins him to the camera. And um, I love Bobby as a commentator, but I think it also shows a little bit of where he was at this point. Yeah, the, the bottle was a big, he's a big fan of the bottle at this point, honestly. Definitely. Uh, so Savage is re receding hairline, pretty embarrassing by this point. <laughs> and he hasn't yet mastered the Naito art of hiding it. Uh, he would get better at it during the, the NWO days, if I remember correctly. Definitely. Uh, Flair tries to get on the mic and get Elizabeth to kiss him before the match. Uh, of course, that's what Flair does, but she does decline here. And then Savage grabs the mic and adds an oh no for good measure instead of his oh, normal oh yeah, which is uh, really funny. Uh, Flair stalls fucking forever before getting in there, before he finally does. Uh, Savage goes right at him and punches away in the corner. Uh, there's a brief moment of miscommunication between the ref and the wrestlers. The Savage goes to like this early cover, but the referee is busy trying to lock the cage door. Uh, this seems to throw them off pretty bad as they have to go into the corner and like have a very badly disguised conversation. I I see a lot of wrestlers have a lot of mid match conversations. This might be the worst disguise one I've ever seen because they just kind of like go in the corner and like rub up against each other's bodies. I'm like, what are you even theoretically doing? Like if this was real. I don't, yeah. I don't think like, it looked horrible. I was like, what the fuck? Uh, I think this match could be the one where we have a big difference of opinion based on what you said earlier. Because I thought this match settled into being kind of boring. Uh, you know, Savage gets out of the figure four. They trade some pretty basic and slow striking. Uh, Savage at one point suddenly climbs to the top of the cage. He leaps off to try and nail Flair with an axe handle. But instead, Flair hits him right in the gut as he lands. They did time that really well. That's probably the best spot of the match. But, uh, you know, I don't know, like, just, I, I had, I felt like I had very little recap here, because, like, they just kind of pound on each other, they just kind of, like, lay around, they just kind of, I don't know, there's just not much to the match to me. A lot yeah, of I mean, I can 
chime in there. I think if I'm remembering right, this is from the era of Savage's WCW career where most of his matches were built around him not doing much and getting his ass kicked and then dropping the big elbow for the win at the end. Yeah. And so when you extend that to longer formulas, um, it doesn't always hit. Yeah. Uh, and Savage, great. He great players had against the cage at one point and woman just starts fucking screeching. And I have to agree with Dusty Rhodes here that she kind of needs to shut up. It's very annoying. <laughs> Sorry to be going with the dead. My God, the screeching was so annoying. Yeah, I wrote a note. It was um, El Desperado in an empty arena-esque. It was very <laughs> distracting. Yeah. Um, we get a blade job from Flair. So the rest of the match at that point is the uh, famous wide-angle shot of doom, which is very annoying. Like, when they, they pull the camera way out, so you you know you're getting a very like wide angle shot because they don't want to show the blood, which is hilarious because they they show the blood close ups on the replay to what you can show it on the replay but you can't show it live. It's just very weird. Like I don't I don't understand WWE standards and practices. Uh, but yeah, so woman she throws some powder at Savage. They try to say it's like rat poison. I'm like, what? yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> like the announcers are like, like woman's <laughs> trying to, and they're very calm about it. Like, oh, that could be rat poison or something. I'm like, right. you're just accusing this woman of trying to kill him. I hope you understand that. <laughs> I have never heard an announcer say that in a powder spot before. <laughs> it was so weird. Uh, she distracts the referee. Elizabeth takes off her high heeled shoe, hands it through the cage to Flair, turns on her now ex husband Savage. I guess the lesson is don't have your ex-wife as your manager. Uh, Savage schools bo- schoolboys flair, which was of course the finish of the WrestleMania match, WrestleMania eight, I believe. Uh, but the ref is busy with woman, and by the time he turns ar- turns around, uh, flair kicks out, and then he hits Savage with Liz's shoe and pins him. Because of course the high heeled shoe is a deadly weapon. Uh, their their obsession with uh, high heel shoes and also hot coffee finishes. <laughs> yeah during this period, would eventually get mocked mercilessly by the WWF and the uh, billionaire Ted skits around this time. And you'll notice the high heel shoe and uh, hot coffee finish has definitely stopped after that. But yes, that makes Flair our winner. And Elizabeth gives us our first look at evil Elizabeth uh, as she leaves. She has, a, she has a pretty good heel grin as she leaves with Flair. Um, and Hogan does come out to save Savage here from Flair and Art Anderson. But yeah, this would... Uh, uh, it's weird to think about because Elizabeth obviously was pretty much a baby face for her whole career up to this point, you know, especially in, uh, even when Savage was a heel in WWF, I mean, she was kind of playing, like, the baby face, you know, uh, who was his manager. And, like, she basically stays a heel for the rest of her career at this point. I mean, she's, you know, she's in the NWO, uh, she. I mean, they do some weird stuff with her character, if I remember right, especially yeah. early with the NWO, where it felt like some weeks she was the reluctant, member who was being blackmailed and didn't want to be there um maybe even being taken advantage of by creepy eric or something uh but then other weeks she was just it felt like she was a full-blown like you know yes i'm evil evil elizabeth you said so yeah it, it was weird i completely forgot about the blackmail stuff that was weird but yeah she's she's like she reunites with savage on their bolt heels in the nwo and then you know she ends up managing like fluger which i think you know obviously that she was seeing him in real life and that's pretty much it for her career. I mean, she's pretty much a heel for the rest of her career. Um, but yeah, Hogan, uh, this does lead to some pretty memorable skits on Nitro with Flair basically giving away mm. Savage's alimony payments and then using them <laughs> to fund, he uses them to fund these VIP sections in the crowd. Yeah. Where he, like, well, I'm like, like, right. I'm not going to lie. Like Flair post this match um, for the next few months until, you know, his character kind of gets moved aside with um, other changes coming. <laughs> Um, I thought was just absolutely fantastic. The taunting he was showing, the celebration he was showing with both women, the money. Um, he was just uh, such an enjoyable heel character at this time. Yeah. And then obviously, yeah, like you said, the NWO will come and kind of ruin it all. But yeah, while it lasted, it was pretty amazing. Uh, the match, though, not that amazing. I mean, you know, it's nothing wrong with it, but I found it really dull. I only got like two and a half stars or so. It just really didn't do much for me. Uh, you know, other than Flair's natural charisma and all that, but like, I don't know. I'm starting to feel like I'm not a big Flair guy because like I, I didn't love his match with Fujinami either, and if it, it feels like I'm starting to like him less and less uh, as I get older, it's just not. I don't know. He's not what I love about wrestling. I guess just these matches always feel very 
we're going to really piss people off here. It's not, I'm not saying he's a bad wrestler, obviously. Right. He's one of the best ever. But like, as far as like what I enjoy out of wrestling, I don't know. Like his matches don't do don't don't often do a lot for me, other than like some of the really famous ones. So I yeah, know. I mean, I won't criticize you for that. Um, I haven't gone back to a lot of watch a lot of his matches, so you know, I feel like I have to hold my judgment a little bit. But I will say, and one of the other things I thought about writing this is, you know, I'm one of the people that actually really got exposed to and fell in love with WCW in that initial post Flair WCW. So I wasn't watching WCW when Flair was at his best. And so I was watching it at a time where a lot of people like really were down on WCW, maybe the most up until, you know, their eventual demise and end. Um, But I really enjoyed that stuff. And so by the time Flair came back to WCW, I was like, cool. Yay. Flair's back. Uh, But he was, Never one of my favorite uh, wrestlers in WCW at the time. Yeah, I mean, he don't pre- he's one of the all-time great promos for sure. But I don't know, I never... Yeah. He's never been one of my favorite wrestlers, and he just really didn't uh, do much for me here again. You know, and, yeah, Savage, so, and Savage did almost nothing, as we talked about. Right. So I enjoyed the match a little more than you. Um, I didn't think it was a, um, as much of a classic as I was hoping. But I do think this actually ta- dovetails in well with some of your critiques. So uh, I'll say I give it three and a half stars. So, you know, full star more than you, but not at that four star greatness level. Um, like I said, by the time the bell rang, I was so hyped because, again, that flair character, that savage character, the setting, like it was all ready. Um, and then, like, you, you identified you at that awkward spot at the beginning. There was a lot of disjointedness in the match. Um, I thought both men did some cage, great cage bumps, but that also, I think, pointed to one of the weaknesses of the match where both guys did a great job selling, but there wasn't a lot of great or innovative offense from either men in the match. Uh, I will say, though, I don't think you mentioned this spot in your recap. I think my favorite spot from any of the six matches we watched occurred in this one, which was... I don't know if it was planned from the beginning or it was something they came up with uh, because of that initial mistake with the ref. But when Flair just turns to the official near the beginning of the match and just cold cocks him so <laughs> perfectly and the official sold it great, just right out on his back. Uh, just the surprise of seeing that early in a match, a heel wrestler because of it being no disqualification, uh, just, turning around and knocking the ref out and just caught me by surprise in a good way. Um, I think kind of got over the danger of the no disqualification step. And for once it was a ref bump that actually looked good. And so I really enjoyed that. Um, Of course, and that also led to one of the problems with the match uh, where Flair had the figure four lock on. And then um, Savage got to the ropes and the ref like made a huge deal to break the hold. And it's like, wait, you've already established this is no disqualification. Why does he have to break the hold just because he reached the ropes? Yeah, that didn't um, make any sense at all. No. So, um, yeah. Also, a lot of flair butt in the match, just to warn <laughs> viewers if you want to go into it. Again, to make a New Japan um, comparison, it kind of reminded me of a Taguchi match from the most recent Best of the Super Juniors. Um, it honestly felt for like maybe the last five minutes um, flair was hanging out of his trunks. So, <laughs> uh, but it had some good comedic value to give credit. Um, yeah, and then the ending, it was a nice callback spot. Um, the shoe's a terrible weapon. But between the callback <laughs> and having Elizabeth turn, uh, which is you know such a big moment in her and Savage's careers at that point, I still enjoyed the finish despite the stupid weapon. And um, so, um, yeah, three and a half. Enjoyed it. Good to very good range, um, but not great. Not something I will feel the need to go back and watch again. Uh, WWE Super Bowl 7, our next show here in 1997, February 23rd. Uh, this is the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Uh, this is WWE is like in their boom here. I mean, this is now the end of your era. You know, thirteen thousand three hundred twenty-four fans, zero point seven four buy rate. Uh, the show has a six point six five rating on Cage Match, so not great, but not bad either. Um, and you could just see like this. This is an enormous card. This is that period where it felt like everybody who mattered in America, in like North American wrestling, is wrestling for WCW with, between the Luch Doors and everything else. Just you know, this is like ninety-seven to me is their their real peak. You know, I, I think they made more money in 98, 
of like those 98 shows like by the second half are starting to feel like okay mm -hmm. uh this is getting kind of shitty <laughs> like what are we doing here whereas 97 i mean not like every show is a hit or anything but like you know the shows are mostly pretty good and it just kind of feels like you know they have all the momentum in american wrestling even though obviously you know wwf actually has a pretty damn good year in 97 too but it, it felt like they were fighting for their lives really um, so this show opens up with a pair of dark matches. Hugh Morris beat Joe Gomez. Ultimo Dragon beats Pat, Tata uh, Pat Tanaka. And as you can hear when we get to the main card, there's another one where the, uh, the auto, uh, the randomizer kind of jabbed us. Uh, Six beats Dean Malenko in the opener to win the Cruiserweight title in 12 minutes. You have a six-man Lucha Tag, Conan, La Parca, and Vill Villano 4, beating Ciclope, uh, Ju Juventud Guerrera, and Super Calo in 952. Prince Ikea beats Rey Mysterio Jr. to retain the TV title at 8.52. DDP beats Buff Bagwell by DQ at 9.45. I guess I could have gotten that. That probably was, that probably was worse. Uh, Eddie Guerrero <laughs> beats Chris Jericho to retain the U.S. title in 12 minutes. The weird period where, like, WCW was letting the Cruiserweights have the U.S. title, because Dean Malenko has it this year, too. Uh, triangle Tag Team Match, The Public Enemy, uh, Johnny Grunge and Rocco Rock beat Harlem Heat, Booker Team Stevie Ray, and Faces of Fear, Megan, uh, Megan the Barbarian, in 7.41. Our match, Jeff Jarrett beats Mongo McMichael in, with Debra in 8.09. Uh, a San Francisco death match, Chris Benoit with Woman beats Kevin Sullivan with Jacqueline in 8.33. Uh, a world tag team title match, Lex Luger and the Giant beat the Outsiders in 8.52 to win the titles, but I think that gets overturned. In uh, the world heavyweight title match, the main event, Hollywood Hogan, Beats Roddy Piper to retain at only 10.54. Um, so a lot of matches here, obviously. Uh, you know, the show opened for the really infamous uh, Roddy Piper escaping Alcatraz promo. Uh, I, of course, had to watch that because I, I remember those from watching as a kid. Like, this is right, to be clear, this is like right around the start of when I was watching WCW and really watching any wrestling, you know, on my own. I, I told the story a million times. I went to WrestleMania 10, uh, you know, as a seven-year-old. And barely even remember it, but my, my cousin was a huge fan, my older cousin. That's why I ended up going to it. But, like, as far as when I started actually watching wrestling on my own as a kid, it really wasn't until, like, NWO era, WCW. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly when, honestly, but it was definitely when, you know, sometime in 96 when the NWO already existed is when I, like, was, you know, started watching it on TNT every week. But, uh, you know, Super Brawl, you know, this is, uh, obviously I would not have seen this show as a kid. I was not ordering pay-per-views. But I definitely remember those Escape Alcatraz promos on Nitro and being, even as a child, I think I was kind of like, what is this? Because, <laughs> like, so he, he he locked himself in Alcatraz. You see him run across the courtyard screaming. This is a closed prison for people to know who, what Alcatraz is. Uh, a closed prison outside of San Francisco on, like, a little prison island. His face is, like, covered in dust or something. And he's like, I didn't spend seven days in hell for nothing. Like, w well, why did you spend seven days in hell? What the fuck are you... What was the point of this? And it's like, really? Okay. And then he says, now get that thing out of my face. And he, he, he like, rides a boat off of there, like, holds on to, the, like, the flagpole or something. And he says, I'm bringing Alcatraz to you. Okay. Yeah, Piper's... <laughs> Last WCW run was just, it was something. I respect his name value. I respect his energy, but just this wasn't the only case of weird character decisions. Yeah, creative like decisions the, 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 the Piper. Piper, the Piper family, leading up to uncensored a month later. Yeah, I mean, just really crazy shit. Uh, so this match, Jarrett versus Mongo, was during the Jeff Jarrett wants to join the Horseman era. Uh, Ric Flair wanted him in the stable. The other members did not. Now. Here's the thing. The announcers cannot explain this. They really have no idea. But the fucking stable's called the Four Horsemen. They already have four. Flair, Art Anderson, who didn't retire until later in the year, Mongo, and Benoit. So Flair suddenly wanted there to be a fifth horseman? I, I, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. And he, you know, the announcers speculate, like, oh, maybe someone... Maybe this means someone gets kicked out now, but like they they never say you know they they don't know basically they have no they clearly idea. say like we have asked which I <laughs> was another one of those comments I wrote like I wonder if this is a shoot comment They're like <laughs> we have asked and no one has explained to us what this means it, it really felt like they were saying uh, so we went up to the bookers backstage and asked and nobody can give us a straight answer exactly. yeah uh, but yeah so I, I think they just had five horsemen 
because he didn't last that long in the group anyway. Uh, so he beats Chris Benoit at Starcade in their DQ match, and now this is his final test. If he wins this, he's a horseman. Uh, but yeah, he he kicked he gets kicked out in June, so only a few months later, and he leaves WWE altogether by October because he jumped uh, back to WWF after his contract expired. So Mongo comes out with Deborah to the Horseman theme, which is a very underrated theme song. That's such a great theme song, the WWE Horseman theme around this time. Uh, he's carrying the inf infamous Halliburton full of money that he took uh, this briefcase back when he joined the group at the Great American Bash 96. One of my favorite turns of all time. It kind of gets forgotten in time, I feel like, because, you know, it's happening, it's happening on the exact same show as the start of the NWO angle, you know? But, like, I mean, they, they, they call it Nash showed up in the weeks before, and they have a famous angle where they powerbomb Eric Bischoff off the stage on that show, who, of course, was with them the whole time, which doesn't make a lot of sense in hindsight. What did you say? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it, it's a great, but it's one of my favorite turns because unlike a lot of heel turns, this, in a, you know, in tag matches, this wasn't some big master plan. So it was the, the tag match, Flair and Arn Anderson against Big Michael and fellow uh, football player Kevin Green. And, you know, they wrestle the match straight. And then so, like, at one point, woman takes Deborah to the back in the middle of the match. Woman comes back out with Deborah, and Deborah's holding this briefcase full of money. She goes over to her husband. She shows him the money. Mongo makes a very pointed moment and thinking about, like, like rubbing his chin, like, hmm. Takes the briefcase, waffles his partner with it, and makes the turn. Uh, it's just such a great moment. Because it's like, it was not some pre planned thing. He, like, on the fly was like, I do like money, actually. <laughs> and just, like, nails his own partner with the briefcase and turn heel. Uh, but yeah, it, was a, I was gonna say, it was a great turn. I loved it because it was one of those where you did not see it coming, yet yeah. it made perfect sense, unlike a lot of other WCW twists later oh, on. Because yeah. um, afterward... WCW, WCW had a lot of turns where there was a tag match, and the guy who's going to turn helps his partner for like 20 straight minutes, and then fucking turns on him at the end of the match. It's like, well, why did you fight with him this entire time if you were just going to turn on him at the end the whole time? It was very... They had a million turns like that, I feel like. So... I will say with the um, unfortunate tragic passing of Kevin Green, I have seen some chatter of people discovering this angle for the first time, though. So okay. maybe now I'll start getting some of the appreciation <laughs> it deserves. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's pretty. I think it's the best thing Mongo ever did in his whole career, which isn't saying a lot, but I do think <laughs> it was. I love that turn. Uh, Jarrett comes out here to his horrible WCW theme at this time. It was like, I don't know, it was like the ultimate like generic country song. It was really terrible. I mean, this, not to spoil too much my thoughts on the match, but his, his entrance, uh, kind of the opposite of our first match, just showed everything that would end up being wrong with the match, in my opinion. Well, I mean, he okay. just came off as a complete goober between the awful music, his still stupid gear, and the fact mm -hmm. that it's just Jeff Jarrett, who naturally looks like a goober. See, now, I, I think we're going to disagree on this one, too, because I actually like this match quite a bit. Oh, uh, that's going to be great, then, because, okay. yeah, we'll get to it. <laughs> uh, so I don't know who the heel and who the face here is supposed to be, but Jarrett arm drags Mongo. He puts his feet up in the corner. That seems pretty heelish, uh, but I would have thought Mongo would be the heel, but they just kind of both work heel. So, uh, But he, he does look a little baby face here. He catches the cocky Jarrett, gives him a decent power slam, but the crowd's not really cheering him or anything. And then he starts he starts chop blocking Jared. It's like these, these chop blocks looked awesome. I mean, just like charging full force and just like you know, I, I guess the from channeling his football days. So I was surprised how cool those chop blocks looked. Um, we start already teasing the upcoming Deb return on Mongo. I don't know if they were split up for real at this point, or this is another example of a wrestling breakup that turns into a real breakup. But she she stops Mongo from beating up Jared on the floor. And then uh, Jarrett, you know, basically tosses Mongo back in, and he starts using the ropes on an abdominal stretch. And then Deborah nails his hand with the briefcase to stop him from cheating. So the announcer starts speculating that maybe she just wants this to be a fair and square match in the ring, which is really funny. They're like, maybe she just really is uh, into fair fighting. <laughs> it's just like such a funny little uh, thing where it's like, you know how yes. wrestling managers and valets are always into. I just want to see <laughs> a fair fight. Deborah McMichael, uh, fair fight. Clean fight specialist, I guess. Exactly. Uh, Mongo gives Jarrett another big slam, clotheslines him over the top. Deborah comes over and offers Jarrett a towel. Mongo gets rid Mongo gets very bad about that. He grabs that towel and like chokes Jarrett with it, then tosses him in the railing a few times. 
Uh, such a weird storyline. Like, all three of them are so unlikable here. Uh, Jarrett turns the tie back in the ring, stomps away on him, chokes him against the middle rope. He does the Brian Danielson, I have till five referee routine many years before Danielson. So maybe, who knows? This is, could be where the American Dragon got it from. Jeff Jarrett, he brought 97. Uh, Jarrett hits a truly horrible clothesline on Mongo. He almost like uh, runs right past, or like Mongo almost runs right past his arm before falling down. So that was definitely Mongo's fault. Uh, but we get a sleeper from Jarrett, but Mongo reverses to one of his own. But Jarrett reverses that back to a pretty nice backdrop suplex. Uh, and both guys are down. Uh, Deborah, <laughs> just while they're both down, Deborah turns to the camera and says, Man, I don't know which one to help. And the announcers are aghast at this. They're like, you are married to one of the participants and you don't know which one to help. And you kind of got to give this one to the announcers. Because of this. Yeah. Well, I, I also really appreciated um, Heenan's line here. I don't know if you caught that one or and not. But he, goes, he just went on, how about the one who pays the bills? <laughs> Bobby Heenan is very sexist on this episode. Like, yes. Jesus, for the, between the thing about the woman, between the thing about woman in the last match and now this. But yep. yeah, I mean, but, but it's a good point. It's like, your husband's <laughs> in the match. What are you talking right. about? You don't know who to help. Uh, Mongo gives him a sidewalk slam. Uh, the ref stops, starts counting, but Mongo's already getting back to his feet, so not noticing the referee's counting. That was a little awkward. He then hits a great boss fan slam on Jarrett for a two count. And the referee gets bumped by Jarrett. Uh, Jarrett kind of like kicks out and like rakes his eyes as getting off a of cover. Brain delivers an incredible line here, very dryly. But he's like, well, he don't see, he couldn't see nothing anyway. So let's make a difference. <laughs> but it's like, wow, probably even just bearing there's some you're officiating. And you know what? It's deserved. Uh, Mongo starts trying to ask for the briefcase. Deborah doesn't want to do it. I love the finish here because she, like, okay, Mongo goes to grab at the briefcase. She turns her back to Mongo, like, I'm not going to do it. She lifts the briefcase up and she tosses it over his head, over him, right to Jarrett. Jarrett catches it perfectly. Great catch by Jeff Jarrett, honestly. And then waffles Mongo with it. I don't know. I just thought it was very clever. Like, I, I've seen many finishes like this where, like, you know, the manager uh, pretends they're helping one person when they actually help the other one. This might be the most ex well executed one I've ever seen. I mean, they timed it perfectly. She threw it perfectly. He caught it perfectly. I mean, it, it couldn't have been easy to throw this fucking giant briefcase over this man's head and, like, get it right into the other guy's hands. So, I don't know. But it's one of the best examples of this finish I've ever seen in my, in my life, honestly. And the ref turns around, counts to three. Jarrett's officially a horseman. And then she turns to the camera and says, now how did that happen? And winks at the camera. <laughs> and the announcers again are like, what the fuck? Like, the announcers are like, what the fuck? Like, I still don't say what the fuck, but they're like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> it's like, great. Uh, but yes, I, I gave this three stars. Confusing, and stupid storyline, but like this is just nowhere near as bad as I was expecting to be. I mean, there were a few awkward spots uh, just because Mongo was not very good at this. Uh, but Jarrett, I thought, did a great job holding it together. Some of Mongo's power offense was actually pretty fun, and the finish was great. And I don't know, I just you know, it could be a three, a very generous three stars. But like, I enjoyed myself for these eight minutes, so I definitely, I, you know, that's what I went on. I went three stars. Hey, wrestling is a very subjective <laughs> business. I'm glad you got to enjoy it. I'm glad one of us did. Um, this was by far my least favorite <laughs> we watched. Um, I do agree with a lot of the uh, positive and negative critiques that you had. Uh, I thought Mongo surprised me with how decent he looked in the ring and not in a ironic, haha, it's Mongo type way. Like some of his moves and some of his character work actually looked decent. Um, and like you said, Jarrett, I thought also, you know, really helped with that playing that veteran hand role for him. So to give credit where it's due, at least um, most of my problems with the match were, um, like you said, just to me, the storyline did not work at all. Um, and when a storyline's not working at all, and then the wrestlers involved are all unlikable at the same time, um, from a fan perspective, um, it makes it hard to really get invested and engage with the match, in my opinion. And so I thought that really hurt it. Um, just, yeah, trying to look at my notes now and what else. I thought the ref <laughs> bump near the end of the match, again, like comparing it to our previous match, was one of the worst ref bumps in oh, the yeah, world. The ref, the ref bump was horrible. Yeah, like, <laughs> barely grazed him. And, you know, again, Bobby's commentary well-deserved after that. Um, I did think... 
Deborah did a good, Deborah and Jarrett did great with the case in the finish, like you said. But I didn't understand why Mongo stood there so long, like <laughs> having a conversation with Deborah afterwards, where it's like, you know, she just threw the case to the guy you're fighting. <laughs> That's a good in this point, match. actually. <laughs> I didn't even think of that part. That's a good point. Yeah. But, but no, the other look, Mongo was, was very uh, aghast at that. He couldn't believe his wife. So that must have been it. He was just so shocked. Like everyone else was like, maybe his wife's turning on, but Mongo was convinced. Like, no, yeah. no, we're tight still, despite her stopping me from cheating multiple times in this match already. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, if he would have bring a towel to my opponent, right? <laughs> I mean, if he would have turned around right away and gone wallop, then I definitely would have bumped up about I don't know maybe half a star. Or so, um, but yeah, I guess the only other note I have is I, it's a shame that I'm pretty sure Jr. never got to call a Mongo match because between his football <laughs> background, uh, being able to bust out bowling shoe ugly and a slobber knocker, I think he just would have loved Mongo matches. Yeah. Um, oh no, and then, of course, I'm sorry. The other big problem fit from my perspective was the storyline leading into it. Um, I felt like they were trying to recapture the magic of Kurt Hennig teasing to join the Horsemen previously. Oh, well, no, that's later. Uh, or is that later? Yeah, it's later this year. Uh, that's, never mind. That's leading, up, that's leading up to Fall Run. I guess not, but then they executed it so much better that time. Yeah. <laughs> because like, I, I do remember Flair putting Jarrett over big in interviews uh, and segments before this pay-per-view. And when Jarrett comes out like there's just not the crowd reaction or the belief that you know puts him at the level of being like oh my god could he be a member of the horseman and so i just think that lack of crowd reaction just really undercut everything that they were doing and from my perspective it just didn't work at all um there you go that annoys me that the Kurt Hennig thing was after that because in my yeah. head I was like, oh, they're trying to recapture the magic because it worked so well. Once, yeah, that was, that's, that's when Arn retires yep. and they do that famous uh, segment. Yeah. You're 100% right. So, yeah. ah, bad memory. I'm sorry, what was, your, uh, what was your stars? My stars was one and a half, <laughs> easily my lowest of the night. There you go. Uh, Super Brawl 98, our second to last one here. Uh, start trying to go a little faster since we're maybe running a little bit longer than I usually like to do these retro roulette ones. Uh, February, I'm, I'm mostly talking to myself because I recap these matches way too much, probably. Uh, Super Brawl 8, February 22nd, 98, again at the Cow Palace, 12,620 fans, a 1.12 buy rate. This is like, you know, 98 Dem Series making money hand over fish, even as hand over fist. They say fish, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> even as they were, uh, you know, doing really, uh, really poorly on some of these shows. Although, you know, this show I think was pretty good. I think it was. Like, the turning point, I think, when the shows start getting really terrible is, like, I don't know, maybe, like, uh, Road Wild? Yeah, Road Wild. I was about to say Road Wild. Yeah, Road Wild. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the shows before Road Wild are that bad. Back to the Beach isn't good, but I don't really think it's that bad. Uh, we, we did a whole episode, like, re, like briefly reviewing all of them, basically. Um, Great American Bash wasn't, like, like yeah, Slam Burrito, like, I really like Spring Stampede. That show's really fun. Um Slamboree to like Bash at the Beach really isn't good, but I don't think those shows are that bad. And then once you get to Roll Wild though, like that starts a run of like some of the worst shows in history where like Roll Wild is terrible, Fall Brawl is terrible, Halloween Havoc's really good. That's like their one little bright spot, although it still has Hogan and fucking Warrior on it. And then World War Three is fucking terrible. And so like some really terrible shows in late 98. And then Starcade is pretty bad too, and it has obviously one of the worst finishes of all time. And the company never recovers. So, you know, the second half of 98, not great for WCW. But the first half, still pretty good stuff here. Uh, this show has a 6.03 on cage match. Uh, the opener, a dark match, Ultimo Dragon beating uh, Shiryu, who, of course, is uh, Kaz Hayashi. Had not yet taken on that name yes, yet, I guess, in WCW. Uh, then we have the match we ended up covering, which was the opener of the show, the WCW World TV title, Booker T, defeating the champion Rick Martel in 1031. Then he has to immediately defend against Saturn in 1420, which we did not cover. Uh, or or I, didn't, I didn't even watch it. I don't know about you. No, uh, I did not either. Then Disco Inferno beats L uh, La Parca. I almost called him L.A. Park, which is his later name, uh, in 1139. Bill Goldberg beats Brad Armstrong in 223. Uh, of course, this was like his original streak run. Uh, Chris Jericho def defends the, the World Cruiserweight title in a title versus mask match against Juventud Guerrera in 1327. The British Bulldog beats Mongo by referee decision. Uh, I can only imagine what the fuck that was. And 6'10". 
Uh, DDP retains the U.S. title against Chris Benoit in 1543. Lex Luger beats Randy Savage in a no-DQ match in 720. The Outsiders beat the Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott, in 414. That's, of course, the Scott Steiner heel turn on Rick uh, in, to win the titles. And then the main event, Sting beats Hogan in 1630 uh, to win the vacant WCW title. We already talked about that. Of course, it was uh, held up at Starcade after the famous non-fast, fast count. And that's also Savage turning on Hogan to uh, really kick off that Hogan-Savage and, you know, feud that eventually becomes the NWO Wolfpack. So. Yeah, and just super quick to answer your big question there, because I know you're extremely curious. The ref um, decision for Bulldog McMichael was um, Bulldog had been working on McMichael's wrist the whole match, and eventually the ref just decided it was too much, and so <laughs> rang the bell, because WCW, no one can get over strong. Uh, but yeah, so this match is Rick Martel's third to last match in his entire career. So he had been out of the major leagues basically since 94. Uh, and I would I want to say this is the one match where like the only one probably where we got it from the auto uh you know the <laughs> the randomizer and I was like yes awesome because I really wanted to see this one. Definitely. Uh, but yeah. So, you know, Martel, this was his third to last match of his career. You know, he came back uh his long WF run ended in July ninety four. He came back for like a one off appearance for the ninety five Royal Rumble. That was his last WWF match of his career. He did some indies in between, but then his big comeback run was supposed to be right here in WCW starting in January 98. But it would wind up only being 13 matches in total. He suffers a big injury during this match. He comes back one more time on the July 13th Nitro, facing Stevie Ray. He suffers another injury in that match and decides to call it a career. And then he does one final match uh, on an indie, sh- indie show in Hawaii. I'm sure uh, the location had to do with that. Like, yes, fly me into Hawaii, please. Right. Uh, March 20th, 1999, against the Metal Maniac, uh, a New Jersey indie guy, who I, I think this was covered on an episode of November to Remember. I could be thinking of the wrong guy, but I, I obviously that's on the Voice of Wrestling Patreon. I think Joe said that uh, Jimmy Snook is bad man, you know, like oh, his, his drug guy. So uh, I think that's basically what he's famous for. But yeah, I've heard the name before. He's definitely not famous for, like, being a good wrestler or anything. <laughs> but... Yeah, that's it for the model. Uh, Booker T, meanwhile, you know, he's getting the first singles push of his career here. You know, he's already, at this point, in 1998, a seven-time WWE Tag Team Champion. And he would get that belt three more times with Stevie in 99, uh, before the team was finally done for good. And then he went it with Test in the WWF during the Alliance uh, in 2001 for 11 WWE Tag Titles total. Uh, but, you know, Stevie had to take time off in early 98 for his own injuries. Uh, January to June. So Booker, you know, became famous during this period for racking up uh, TV title wins. So he wins the belt for the first time on the December 29th, 97 Nitro from the Disco Inferno. Uh, he holds it all the way up to February 16th, 98 Nitro, you know, making weekly defenses on TV. So 10 defenses in total. Uh, Rick Martel beats him there. Uh, and this is his return match against Martel only six days later. And the winner, for a reason that's never explained by the announcer, so I have no idea what it is, but the winner has to fight Saturn immediately for some reason. I don't know why Perry Saturn uh, got this fucking immediate title shot against a, a guy who just went through a whole match, but he did, so there you go. If I remember right, I I think it was that um, Booker T was originally going to defend the title against Saturn, and then Martel upset Booker T, and so they're like, well, Booker T's getting his return shot, and Saturn still had the shot scheduled in, which is okay. really unfair for the champion to have yeah. to wrestle twice. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, the announcers never explained it. Yeah. But in my head, I think that was the storyline there before, or something at least close to that. Well, I'm glad there wasn't an explanation. Like it would have been nice if the announcer had said that, but they never right. did. They never, they never <laughs> did. But yeah, uh, Booker would win this, of course, and he beat Saturn as well. So he had the TV belt for another six or seven days. He would hold it five more times total just between now and August. And he held it one more time in his career briefly, uh, March to May in 99, before obviously moving on to bigger and big, bigger and better things, including his famous five WCW world title reigns. Uh, one of those was actually in the Alliance stage, which I feel like nobody remembers. But yeah, one of those title wins, like he lost it to Kurt Angle and wins it back during the Alliance period. Uh, but fans of WCW sure love racing the roof for Booker. That's my first note here. <laughs> Uh, my girlfriend Nicole was sitting next to me, and she was like, 
she is like, I've never seen this many white people racing the room. And I'm like, that's that's every WCW show, you know, during Booker's face run. It's like a whole bunch of white people going like, yeah, I can do this. It's culturally appropriate <laughs> right now because the Booker T is leading me. It's like, they're like, they're very into it. Uh, you know, Martel looks like a million bucks coming out of here. It's really a shame this run ended so quickly. I always love Rick Martel, so I'm probably being a little bit of a mark from here, but like, he looks great. So. Uh, Rick Martel, he offers a handshake at the start. The fans don't buy it. Booker slaps his hand away, goes to town on him, and, you know, he's such a, Martel is such a great old school hero here. He just sells his ass off for Booker's offense and then, like, slaps the ring in anger on the outside. Just great stuff. He starts fighting back in the ring. The flock casually shows up in the background, including, obviously, Saturn. I love the flock. I don't know how you feel about the flock. I, I, as a kid, I oh. love them. And watching it back, I, may, I might love them even more. I mean, just such a great... Like, WCW should have just fucking ran all the way with them. They should have made Raven world champion. Because they, yeah, so, they were so cool. Say, I was a teenager when the flock came out. Of course I loved the flock. They were fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I was much... I was a little younger. I was, like, I guess 12 years... Or 11 years old at this point, And then going on 12. But I, I love the flock. They, they just felt so different from anything else in the company. You know, the exactly. way they would, they would come out and, you know, just sit in the fucking front row all the time and, you know, just, yeah, it was such a cool gimmick. Um, So, you know, Rick Martell beats up Booker in the corner. He takes a big spin kick and then Booker kind of knocks him off when he tries to roll him up, just kind of like, you know, fling, sends him flinging. And Rick Martell takes him, basically takes a Nitro bump for this. He takes his awesome rolling back backwards bump just like right on his neck. And like move like rolling backwards after that, like just like wow, buddy. I can see why you got injured because like these bumps are crazy. He then walks right into a super kick from Booker, a pretty great super kick for a two count. Uh, the announcers are aghast that Booker didn't try to cover him right away. And that's we kind of touched on this earlier with the the win money thing, but that's the kind of stuff I loved the, the WCW announcers for before they totally went to hell. Where like they always called this shit like they were calling an actual fucking sport. Like they would critique the ring technique. Uh, or, like, get mad at too much showboating or whatever without going for covers. I mean, you never got that stuff out of the WWF guys. Especially in 1998. Are you kidding? You probably had, like, you know, fucking Jerry Lawler was probably too busy screaming about puppets. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, no, I Rick totally agree. That was actually, one of my notes was, outside of not explaining the two-match setup, I thought the announcers did a fantastic job calling this match and really got both wrestlers over. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Rick Martel, he backdrops Booker all the way over the top rope to the floor. That used to be a DQ and WCW up to some point. Do you remember when? I was trying, I tried to Google to find out, and Google was really no help, but... I think it pretty much ended when, all the way back when Bill Watts left, actually, but okay. then he would occasionally bring it back when it fit storyline purposes, if I, I remember right. Yeah, because I could have sworn I was watching some show in like 94 or something and they had it and I, I remember being shocked that it was still going on that yeah. late so maybe... I think it was just really when he wanted to do it storyline purposes I think a couple times when the NWA titles got um, brought back into the company um, they would always book that finish for the NWA title so mm. uh, done differently if I remember right but yeah, I think it was very selective after Bill Watts left. So obviously someone will direct message you or me after this yeah. correct. Yeah, so Bill Watts leaving, that would have been the end of night too. So yeah, if you are listening and you uh, happen to know the answer, that's when WCW uh, got rid of the top rope DQ rule uh, at Russell Omakase on Twitter. Please let us know. Uh, Rick Martel beats on Booker back in the ring, misses a charge in the corner, comes right back with some punches and a sidewalk slam. Uh, misses an elbow drop. But, he, okay, this is the best spin of Rooney of all time. He misses his elbow drop. He goes right into the spin of Rooney and then immediately hits a charging form. It's like, instead of being a taunt, the spin of Rooney was like his transition to get right back to his feet immediately and go right back on offense after missing the elbow drop. It was awesome. Yeah, it was brilliant. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, he did it so fast to get right back up and hit the move. It was so cool. Uh, Rick Martel goes to the chin lock. Thanks for not for that long. Hits a big spine buster. Locks in a Boston Crab. Booker is very close to the ropes and reaches out and gets the bottom rope. Uh, Booker rolls through a Martel crossbody. Nearly pins him. Then gets a roll up off the ropes for another two count. But Martel comes right back with a really good clothesline for his uh, own near fall. And then Booker ducks a pair of uh, another pair of clothesline attempts. 
before hitting a big charging forearm, and then the scissors kick. He sends him in the ropes, hits a huge spine buster, heads the top rope, but tries for another crossbody off the ropes, and uh, Rick Martel ducks it. Booker, like, really eats shit on this, like, just wipes out. Uh, you know, it was quite the bump. He comes back with a huge sidekick as Rick Martel le leaps off the ropes, uh, and that's it for the pin. So, you know, Saturn immediately charges the ring and tosses Martel out, which Nicole, again, watching them, we thought that was really funny for some reason. <laughs> she started laughing really hard. She's like, this guy just charges in, just tosses this guy, and just lost. <laughs> like, he's a bag of crap. She's really got a kick out of that. Uh, and then puts Booker in the rings of Saturn. So we go right into the next match, but again, I didn't watch it. Uh, you know, it was 14 minutes, folks, and uh, I have I have to watch five more ma five matches for uh, tomorrow's recording, too. So, you know. Trying to fix everything, fit everything in here is hard. But yeah, we this all have was, our limits. Yeah, exactly. This was really good though. Pretty much just as good as I remembered it. Uh, you know, when I when I got the the match here. I mean, it's a little like it's a little too punchy kicky at times for me to go like four stars, but both guys worked so hard. They took some gnarly bumps. Rick Bartel was such a pro in there. Booker was awesome. Those kicks looked like they killed him. Uh, you know, definitely a guy. You know, Booker's a guy I enjoyed a lot more in WCW, obviously. I think that's pretty common. But yeah, I mean, like, and Rick Bartel, I mean, I wish this run could have continued because he looked great here. So three and three quarters for me. The best match we talked about on this episode, uh, you know, by a wide, wide margin. The best match we will talk about, too. And after, you know, the next match is good, too. But this is, like, fucking great. Yeah, I think you pretty much hit almost everything that I really enjoyed in the match. Um I thought Martel really worked that aggressive he heel style really well and was a great compliment to Booker T. Um, like you said, the fans, it wasn't just raising the roof, although they love to do that. But I mean, they just love them <laughs> Booker T, period, uh, which was just great from a crowd heat perspective. Um, so, yeah, I won't repeat everything that you said, but I will say um, I also went three and a half. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the match after this, but I went three and a half and it ended up being my favorite match of the night as well. Although I also went three and a half on Flair Savage. To me, the difference was Flair Savage were given a much bigger opportunity and stage and just got to three and a half where this was the opener and, you know, less opportunity and they got there as well. So good for Martel, good for Booker T, really fun match. Um, I will say as someone that primarily watched WCW when Martel first showed up, uh, I kind of rolled my eyes at like, oh, another old WWF guy coming here just to collect a paycheck. And then immediately was just like, oh, no, never mind. <laughs> um, dude was just solid. I was really excited for him. And um, I remembered his one was really brief. I actually did not remember that this was the match where he got injured. And by the time I figured that out during the match, I just wrote like a big like, oh, fuck, this is where he blows out his knee, sad face. <laughs> like, it was very sad to remember that all of a sudden. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know if you caught this as well, um, but then when I did realize that, I read a little bit about his knee injury and what happened, and at least one of the accounts that I read said, um, first off, he injured it early in the match, mm. uh, and so they actually reworked the match on the fly, and they said originally Martel was supposed to win and defeat Saturn after or afterwards, and so they had to rebook two at, or both matches on the fly. I have no clue if that's valid or not. I had never heard that before, but I was like, oh, that's really interesting from a what if perspective. Yeah. Um, and again, from everything I read, they actually said he first injured a knee pretty early in the match when he took one of those bumps you were talking about. And his leg bounced off the rope at an area, uh, just at a bad angle. And so that hurt it. And so I was really impressed by how they worked the match after that, if that's true. Um, although I'm not sure I buy the rebooking, just because I didn't think the two wrestlers and the ref really talked to each other that much. Like, nothing noticeable to me, at least. Yeah. Uh, if he did rework it, then that makes this match even greater, because they hit it extremely well. Um, but then apparently when he took the finish, which looked absolutely sick, um, that further aggravated the knee injury, unfortunately. Mm. And as you said, pretty much ended Martel's career, which there is a shame because like, I really think he could have been an asset to the WCW, like undercard, midcard area for a while, um, the way he was working. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there you go. Did you give a star rating? I'm sorry, the guy. Yes, uh, three and a half. Okay, so a little lower, but what are you going to do? Just a little. Like I said, my favorite match because yeah. they did more with less so good for them uh the final show we're going to talk about with the final match super brawl revenge so we fast forward here to 2001 february 18th 01 and 
after all these buy rates have been giving, this one is 0.15. As you can see, no one bought this show in real time as WCW was careening towards a conclusion here. Uh, this, was, this was from the Nashville Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee, an attendance of 4,395, probably all paper, uh, a 5.0 rating on Cage Match, so not a great rating or anything. Not horrible either, though, but just very average, I guess. Um, you know, this, the... the the fans that were there did not seem very into everything, but the the, the crowd noise was very high. It tricked me for a second during the match. I'm like, oh wait, this was during the period where they had like the the fucking heat machine for every yeah. match. Yeah, no, I had the exact same reaction. I was like, wow, the crowd is really into this match. I was like, that is so good for them for dead dying days WCW. And I was actually pretty proud of the crowd. And then about two minutes later, it was like, wait a second, it's kind of the same noise level. It's kind of the no same noise level, and no one's doing anything on camera. Exactly. They're all sitting there like looking completely bored. And I'm like, oh, now I want to give them credit. The WCW noise machine during this period, I think it goes back to like 2000 during like the Russo era way better than the WWF one they would use later on SmackDown. Because, like, that SmackDown one has that horrible, like, generic, like, vacuum cleaner sound. You know what I'm talking... I, like, we're, I like, haven't watched any of that, so... Okay. I, so, like, I, there's I there's basically, like, the, the SmackDown, you know, it would have, like... I don't know how to do it. It's like, oh! Like, it sounds <laughs> very... Like, every time the fans want to cheer, it sounds so fucking fake. Like, I, I'm pretty sure anyone who's ever watched the show... You know, especially during the early years, we'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Where like the fake crowd heat on SmackDown sounded incredibly fake, and I'm just like, I don't even remember being tricked by that at the time. So whereas this one did trick me for a couple minutes during the actual match, and it's like, oh, that's the heat machine. Yeah. I Actually, think I like do a... think I know what you're talking about. I, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about more recent WWE tapings, oh. but yes, I remember what you're saying now about SmackDown from yeah. the contemporary. Yes, this was better. And actually, <laughs> like we both said, I think it tricked us for a few minutes. So good for yeah. that. Um, the other thing too, I guess, um, well, the, so the heat machine, the, the, one of the famous examples of it, I don't remember what show it was, but there was a show where there was a match, uh, like a, some kind of fucking wedding match involving, I guess, uh, Stacey Keeler, Miss Hancock and Daphne. And, you know, this cake gets destroyed. I think it might be Bash the Beach 2000, but don't hold me to that. So this cake gets destroyed. It's all over the ring. These, um... You know, the these this cleaning crew has to come in to clean it all up, and they accidentally left the heat machine on. So as the announcers are like talking over, you know, the site of these these work these uh cleaning workers, you know, cleaning up this cake, you can hear the crowd go. The pretend crowd is like cheering very loudly, and it's like the fans are very into seeing people clean up cake. They love it. That's what they paid to see. Damn it. It's like incredibly WCW, but there you go. Uh, so yes, this show it opened up with a dark match. Chris Harris, of all people, believe the same guy from America's Most Wanted uh, in TNA. Not that long after, yes, it is. There you go. Uh, he beats Kid Romeo in the dark match. Who, of course, uh, never really got to do much at the WCW close. He was like the WCW Cruiserweight Tag Champion. Then we had a Cruiserweight Six Man Elimination Match: Shane Helms beating Evan Courageous. Jamie Noble, Kazayashi, Shannon Moore, and Yang, and Jimmy Yang, of course, in 1717. Would have been great to see that one, but what are you going to do? Uh, Hugh Morris beat The Wall in 935. The match we got here, the WWE World Tag Team titles, Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare defeating Mark Jinjak and Sean Stasiak in 1137. Cruiserweight title, Chavo Guerrero Jr. beats Rey Mysterio Jr. in 1553 to retain. Rick Steiner beats Dustin Rhodes to retain the U.S. Heavyweight title in 914. Totally buff, buff Bagwell and Lex Luger beat Chronic, Brian Adams, and Brian Clark in 647. That one would have sucked to watch, so there you go. They did dodge a bullet there. The WCW commissionership match during the weird period where WCW turned the commissionership into a title, like people were supposed to care about that. Uh, the Cat with Miss Jones beat Lance Storm in 808. Why did Lance Storm want to be commissioner of WCW? I can't tell you. Uh, Canyon defeats Diamond Dallas Page in 8.15. Uh, then DDP beats Jeff Jarrett in 8.30. Uh, and then finally, the WCW World of Red title. Best two out of three falls. Loser leaves WCW. Falls count anywhere match. If you're wondering why there's so many steps, it's because uh, Kevin Nash beats Scott Steiner in about 30 seconds in this match with a belt shot. And Ric Flair, who was present at the time and, you know, in the, the heel stable. Why did, so again, there's a president and a commissioner. They both have matchmaking power, I guess. 
But uh, anyway, so Flair is, you know, basically turns into the two or three falls on the fly, and also turns into falls can anywhere on the fly, you know, to save the title for Steiner. Uh, actually, 16 seconds for the first fall, so even better. The man who was being built up as a monster heel at the time, by the way, because the idea was to bring Goldberg back to beat him eventually after the restart that never got to happen, of course, when they uh, fused and didn't buy the company. So yes, makes a lot of sense to job your big monster heel champion to Kevin Nash in 16 seconds with a belt shot, but that's what they did here. Uh, but Steiner did eventually win the match. Uh, but yes, uh, I mean, that would have been fun to talk about just as a train wreck, probably, but you know, it's not the match we got here. No. I also <laughs> think Kenny and DDP could have been a fun match from yeah. a humor perspective, but alas, we got a different match. But I thought our match was okay, so. Yeah, it was pretty good. So this was during the Natural Born Thrillers era. Uh, the teams had been, the original teams in this in this unit, this was like the unit of WCW Power Plant graduates, these big strapping dudes. Uh, and the teams had been Jindrak and O'Hare and the perfect event, Palumbo and Stasiak. That name was always very stupid. Uh, for pretty much all of 2000, those are the two teams. The perfect event was because Chuck Palumbo was doing like a fake uh, Mr. Perfect, you know, gimmick to Fuba Kerr Henning. But, you know, anyway. Uh, Jim Jack and O'Hare. Oh, no, 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 wait. Steve Jack was doing the fake Mr. Perfect. Palumbo was doing the fake Lex Luger gimmick. Yes. But I don't know why they were the perfect event. I don't know what, like, what does that have to do? What does event have to do with the total package? Anyway, I have no idea. And of course. They did it more thought than they did, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, so Jindrak and O'Hare, you know, held the tag titles twice. Jindrak and... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Jindrak and O'Hare held them twice, yeah. And Palumbo and Stajak held them three times. But then suddenly, Palumbo replaced Jindrak as O'Hare's partner, and they won the tag titles on January 14th in 2001. So now the two jilted partners, uh, Jindrak and Stajak, are trying to get the belts here. Uh, of course, the Palumbo and O'Hare, O'Hare team would last uh, quite a while after this. They would hold the WWE tag titles into the invasion days where they lose them to Undertaker and Kane in August and just kind of like, you know, they just kind of both get jobbed out after that. And, you know, they do, they do other stuff as singles after that. Like, uh, Palumbo has a biker gimmick for a while. Of course he does Billy and Chuck, uh, before that, which is a fa- very famous, uh, I don't know, fake gay tag team, I guess you'd call it. And Sean O'Hare has the, the even more famous to me, at least the, uh, the devil's advocate gimmick that like should have been one of the coolest things ever. And they just never did anything with it. So, uh, but, but those those first vignettes were still amazing. Um, but yeah, Jim Jack and Stasiak really, uh, <laughs> they really get even less than that. Uh, Stasiak, you know, they, they lose this match, they go their separate ways. Stasiak gets paired up with Stacey Keebler towards the end of the company, then gets rebranded as a complete idiot during the Alliance period in WWF. Uh, poor Jim Jack doesn't even make the WWF roster during the Alliance. He goes straight to OVW. Uh, he does... Finally show up on Raw in, like, late 02. Apparently, I mean, the legend always goes he was considered for a spot in Evolution. And I guess it's the spot that went to Randy Orton instead. So we could be talking about, like, Mark Jindrak to this day. Who the fuck knows uh, in WWE? But instead, it's Randy Orton, obviously. And Jindrak would be out of the company without ever getting much traction uh, in June 2005. And he got one single New Japan tour right after his departure uh, from w- from WWE at the time. Uh, before he settles into what would become the role for the rest of his career, uh, all the way up to what seems to be his retirement in 2018, uh, which is, I don't know if that's official, but he, there's no more matches on Cage Match, uh, when he be Marcelo Corleone and CMLL. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but yes, the big Italian gimmick in CMLL, he would basically work the rest of his career, you know, 13 years in CMLL. But I think he'd be a pretty big star there, although I'm not obviously not a CMLL expert, but... Yeah. I remember once seeing a match, um, a trios match with him when um, Naito was um, over there um, first uh, teaming up with his Los Incanables, uh friends. Mm-hmm. And I thought Jinjak, or uh, not, oh yeah, I thought he looked, um, or Palumbo, excuse me, I thought he looked pretty decent. There. No, it was, was Jinjak, yeah. Or Jinjak, yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Getting confused now, but um, <laughs> yeah, I thought he looked, I, I was surprised because I didn't even know he was there until I went back and watched that match. I was like, oh, and yeah, it was a fun match. So Stage Jack starts out here by cutting a cheap heat promo, making fun of the Tennessee Titans before the match to, I guess, firmly establish them as the heels. And I vaguely remember Palumbo and O'Hare basically turned babyface at this point. And O'Hare cuts a very awkward rebuttal as he comes out. Where it's like, <laughs> it was yes, awful. Yeah, it was pretty terrible. Uh, Stasiak hits some repeated clotheslines on O'Hare. 
Uh, but then O'Hare comes back with a crossbody for a two count. And this is where I put down at first. The crowd's surprisingly hot for this. <laughs> but no, they, they weren't. They were It's just a fake crowd beneath. Uh, O'Hare hits a very sloppy stun gun on Jindrak, almost falls over himself as he takes uh, Jindrak's neck over the top rope. But then Palumbo immediately hits a drop kick from the outside as Jindrak lands. That was kind of cool. Uh, they keep t- double teaming Jindrak with perfectly fine offense before Palumbo slaps out a headlock. Certainly an odd choice for a baby face in 2001. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the sleeper, you know, the sleeper hold was kind of a dead move in North America at this point. I mean, just very. Uh, like, the only person doing it in WWF, obviously, was, like, X-Pac, and you would see it a lot in WCW at the time, and having a baby face do it was, like, the ultimate, like, why did you tell them to do this? Like, this is a heel move at this point, and really kind of a dead move, other than just to get people to chant boring, and just very weird. Uh, Jindrak pushes him off, and then they do a few counters before Palumbo hits a big arm drag. That looked pretty good. And then he catapults Jindrak into his own partner, as this resembles a squash match at this point, but then Jindrak Finally gets a clothesline on Palumbo to cut him off. And then they work over Palumbo for a long time after that. I mean, they, you know, just a long, long time. And the double team stuff, I wouldn't say it's like anything special, but it's certainly not boring either. You know, they're working a, a pretty fast pace here for the most part. Uh, Palumbo, yeah. Palumbo. For how long the heat segment went, I was, and how early into their career most of these wrestlers were, I was actually surprised at how well worked it was. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Palumbo keeps getting like little mini teases of a comeback too, so it's laid out well. Very obviously, very Southern tag style, but you know, really, you know, the, the teases were were very well timed to you know keep making you think, not lose hope or anything. Yeah, it's a good formula for a reason. Things slow down as Jinjack gets a headlock, uh, you know, can but then like continually gets his legs on the ropes for extra leverage, extra leverage, and Charles Robinson catches him. But he doesn't actually make him let go of the hold, which it's I always hate when the referees do that. It's like, okay, you caught this man cheating in his hold. You make him let go of the hold. You just don't make him get his foot up, feet off the ropes. Like, you know. Anyway. Uh Palumbo elbows his way out of it, but runs right into a knee. And, I'm, and then this is kind of where like I guess I have the note here. I'm like, wait a second about the crowd. So I guess I noticed it much later than you did. Because like this is where my note is like, wait, uh, I think this might be audio sweetening action because the fans <laughs> on camera look pretty bored and not like they're really reacting at all. And that's why I was like, oh yeah, they do. They did do the heat machine stuff a lot around this time. But like I said, it certainly sounds a lot better than the fucking SmackDown vacuum cleaner. Uh, Stasiak misses a big splash off the top as Palumbo tries to finally make the tag. Palumbo grabs him from behind into a headlock. Uh, I'm sorry, Stasiak grabs him from behind the headlock, but Palumbo immediately hits a big jawbreaker. That was great. It's a really great job, Raker. Just goes flying. And O'Hare tags in, clotheslines everybody. Just everybody gets clotheslined repeatedly. And Stasiak comes in with his own clothesline on, on O'Hare. But Palumbo comes in to make the save. And I, I did like the announcer stressing, like, oh, how impressive it was for Palumbo to make the save after all the damage he took. And O'Hare gets another big clothesline, kind of a glancing super kick. Palumbo fires up, uh, follows up with his own super kick on Stasiak. And O'Hare hits a senton bomb for the pin. Uh, this is a pretty good little match. I mean, like, it didn't overstay its welcome. Uh, the, the long heat segment on Palumbo was pretty good. The hot tag to O'Hare was good, and they went right to the finish after that. I mean, like, you know, nothing you gotta go out of your way to see or anything, but I thought it was pretty easily the second best match we talked about on this episode. I went three and a quarter, so I liked it. Yeah, no, it was definitely just a fun match. Um, uh, was a pleasant surprise for me. It's, you know, 2000 WCW, and... A lot of younger wrestlers, I thought it was going to be a train wreck heading into it, uh, but they all worked really well to give them credit. Um, nice, fast pace throughout it, even during the extended heat sequence. A ton of clotheslines, like you said, but I mean, they really threw those clotheslines to give them credit and made them look good. Uh, crowd was dead for most of it, but they did pop for the hot tag at the end and again for the Shantan bomb. So, uh, oh, yeah, that's what he called it, right? Was, yes, it says Sean. <laughs> Yeah. Such a clever name. Yeah. That, um, how'd they ever lose all that money? Right. Ideas um, like that. But yeah, I mean, and I will say, like, you know, um O'Hare in particular, just even knowing how his career as you laid out went to basically nothing after this, he looked like a star here. And again, it was one of those like, how did his career go to enough? <laughs> Especially when you like, I mean, his size, good agility, good explosiveness, a look that 
I mean, it's terrible by today's standards, but was very much a good look in 2001. Yeah. Um, and like you said, the most awkward part about him was that opening promo, but then the vignettes he did in WWF, WWE, whatever they were at the time, were good. So, you know, he could do stuff um, character-wise like that. And um, yeah, I, you know, it just never worked out for him. So, but yeah, good match, three stars, my third favorite match of the night. There you go. That's our journey through six random matches from six random Super Brawls. Some fun stuff, some shitty stuff, some stuff in between. Uh, nothing I would call like a must-watch match. The closest thing, I guess, would be that Booker Martel match. But, uh, you know, the only thing here I would say, like, really steer clear of is probably that uh, Terry Taylor, uh, you know, Buff Bagwell match, which really is not very good at all. But the rest of the stuff is all, like, solid to good. So, you know, plenty of good stuff here. If you say so. I'm still not sold on Jarrett <laughs> That was a big surprise for me. But, yeah, I think a lot of people probably wouldn't like that as much as I did. But I was just very surprised by that one. All right, so we can wrap things up here. Uh, Matt, you got anything you want to plug? Uh, if you want, you can follow me on Twitter at Archiving Matt. Uh, occasionally tweet about wrestling, but also tweet about a lot of boring archive stuff. So do it at your own discretion. There you go. So folks, uh, as far if you're listening to this and you're like, what the fuck, John? You talk about Japanese wrestling on this show. What's all this WCW crap? Well, don't worry, because uh, you know we got two episodes coming up. First of all, like I said at the start, the... Patreon episode with myself and WH Park, the five matches episode. That will be going up on Monday. Uh, our five matches episode covering you know, five matches, all Japanese wrestling matches. Uh, you know, I, I've watched the, the first one so far, which is awesome. Can't wait to talk about that with them tomorrow. So again, that'll be on the Patreon at patreon.com slash wrestling on Mikase. And next week, uh, here on the free feed, my God, we have a lot of wrestling shows to talk about. So we have New Japan, New Beginning Hiroshima, nights 1 and 2. That's February 10th and 11th, the Wednesday, Thursday. Noah's big return to the Nippon Budokan for all this time. February 12th, that's Friday. And the DDT Kawasaki Strong Show from February 14th on Sunday. I know we haven't done DDT in a little while here, so it'd be good to get back into them. And that's the big uh, Endo versus Akiyama KOD title match show. So that's a, that's a really big show. Uh, so yes, we have to cover four pretty goddamn big shows uh, in one episode. So that'll be quite the challenge. Uh, Gerard, of course, from Voice to Wrestling will be on here with me to try to get it done. And I know he watches all this stuff, so he'll be be a great help. Uh, and we'll see. Hopefully we can get through it. I definitely have to cut back on some of my match recaps to get through all the shows, probably. So it's a Herculean a task for, or for sure. Yeah. So good for you guys for doing it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's two weeks here where they put, like, all the shows in February. There's another one two weeks later that had like two Castle Attack shows and All Japan Corkin, a Noah Corkin, a DDT Corkin. Where I don't even know if we can cover all that. But yeah, I mean, this is going to be how a lot of stuff to do next week. So look out for that in the free feed. Plenty of Japanese wrestling stuff coming up. But in the meantime, uh, thank you as always for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at WrestleOmakase. Wrestling, of course, would not fit. And we will see you next time.